get started. So please take a seat so if you can. Welcome to the uh, first community engagement session that we're having over the next three weeks. It's uh, great uh, to start here in Chetland. It's great to be back here. As former Mayor Nichols knows that I've been here before. Um, would like to acknowledge that we are on the uh, traditional territories of the Treaty 8 First Nations. My name is uh, David Marshall. I'll be your uh, moderator this evening. And uh, before we get underway, um, I'd like to introduce to you Tom Ethia. Tom is the uh, Assistant Deputy Minister with the Ministry of Forest Lands and Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development. And he'll provide you with a few words of welcome on behalf of the uh, Governor of British, British Columbia. Tom? Thank you, David. So it's good to be here tonight in Chaplin to speak to the residents of Chaplin and the residents throughout the piece who've traveled uh, to be here with us tonight uh, to talk about the details of both the conservation agreement between uh, the Section 11 agreement between Canada and British Columbia and the partnership agreement uh, between British Columbia, Canada, West Mobile and Soto. Our, mo our main focus here tonight will be, though, on the partnership agreement that is focused on recovery actions for the central uh, unit of the Southern Mountain Caribou. And uh, while well, I admit it has taken a while for us to get to a stable draft for uh, engagement, review, input by the citizens here and across British Columbia, this is an important step, and we really, I really want to be to assure you that we're here to listen, listen carefully, and uh, take your advice and incorporate it into the decisions that both Canada and British Columbia need to take back to their respective governments on the partnership agreement that is draft. It, it remains draft until we take it into cabinet, until we, 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 we present the findings both of these uh, consultation sessions and the impact analysis that we are also doing as well. So. It, this is the, the opening night, I guess, and it's, a, it's an important night and we're, we're here to listen and we look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tom. Uh, once again, uh, thanks very much for everybody coming. It's just a wonderful turnout here tonight. The first thing we'd like to do is just tell you a little bit about what we have in store for this evening. Um, as Tom said, uh, we're really looking for informed input from the community. And you'll see our two key objectives. And uh, these objectives are on the agenda that hopefully you picked up on the way in. Uh, first of all, we're, we're breaking the, uh, the program tonight down to, to two parts. Um, to provide you with as much information as we can on these draft agreements. And I know there's a, a little bit of confusion out there, but there are two draft agreements. There is Section 11 that applies to the Southern Mountain Caribou, and there's the draft partnership agreement that uh, relates to the central group of the Southern Mountain Caribou, and probably of most interest to the residents here in Chetway. And the second part is to obtain input from you, as Tom just said. It's really important to get this input before the agreements are finalized. So there's your opportunity now to get that information in. That information will then end up being incorporated into a document that we're calling what we heard document. So we can feed back exactly what we hear from you this evening. The agenda, as you hopefully picked up, is uh, around that we'll end up with some introductions and welcomes and there'll be a number of presentations uh, relating to uh, the extent and nature of caribou populations right now, talking about caribou recovery programs, we have the benefit of a video the First Nations, West Moberly and Salto have put together. Um, 
the actual agreements themselves. And then we'll take a break, give you an opportunity to talk to each other, talk to the resource people that we have here tonight, read the posters, the information on the wall, and then have an opportunity to provide direct input to us. There are feedback forms that are on the Engage BC website and will help you understand those feedback forms and give you lots of opportunity to fill them out, not only just this evening, but in the next couple of weeks. Just a few things to keep in mind, because there are a lot of people here tonight, and I'm sure there's a lot of people want to say, have lots on their minds. And so, just keep these in mind, because we have so many people. First of all, the way we've laid out the agenda, try to understand, first of all, the information that's being presented, and then help yourself be understood and the various input that you want to make to us. Raise your hand if you want to ask a question. Unfortunately, we only have one roving mic. We were hoping to have three. So we're going to have to work our way around the room with the various questions. If you can at all, please be succinct. Be respectful of your colleagues because there's probably a lot of people that have lots to say. And again, I hope we'll be respectful and constructive and we we'll work towards hopefully some very effective input. Um, now I'm going to switch to the agenda. Um, and the first person up is uh, um, Dale Seip, who's a biologist with the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy. Dale certainly isn't a stranger to most of you. He's done a lot of work in this area. Very, very credible scientist who's going to give us a little bit of information on what's happening with the southern mountain caribou, especially the central mountain caribou as of now. Dale? Okay, so indeed I've uh, been studying caribou for quite a long time, over 30 years in uh, British Columbia and uh, about 18 years here in the South Peace. And I'm going to talk about the biology and conservation of caribou in the South Peace. So basically all the caribou in all of British Columbia are, are woodland caribou. So the subspecies is woodland caribou. In fact, all the caribou and reindeer in the entire world are actually just one species. And then they're broken down into a number of subspecies. There's three subspecies of caribou in Canada, and the one we have here across the province is the woodland caribou. However, if we break them down somewhat further than that, and these are things called designatable units. So at the federal level, the different caribou populations are broken down into these different uh, designatable units. And these are the units at which we try to monitor the status and plan for the conservation of caribou herds. This is based on differences in the geography, the habitat selection, and the genetics. Now the herd we're here to talk about today is that... Uh, ah, shot myself with the laser. That doesn't show up. Okay. Is uh, you know where we are? So it's the brown one, number eight. And there we go. It's right here. So these are the central mountain caribou. And one of the interesting things genetically about these is when we look at the mitochondrial DNA, we see that this is a mixture of caribou that 
prior to glaciation, some of them were up in Beringia, up in the Yukon, others were south of the ice sheet when the glaciers retreated. This is kind of the first place where these caribou came together, which kind of makes them genetically distinct. So we're here today to talk about the conservation and recovery of these central mountain caribou. So, like I said, we've been working on these caribou since 2002, and most of this work is based on radio telemetry, capturing caribou and putting radio collars on them. The way we do this is we capture them up in the alpine in the wintertime, uh, shoot a net on them from a helicopter with something called a net gun. Uh, you can see up in the top corner there is the net that's just been taken off that animal. put the radio collar on them and let them go. And over the time we've been working on these guys, there's been a real evolution in uh, radio collars. When we started out, they were just the collars where you had to go out in an airplane and listen for the beep and find out where they were. These kind of evolved into GPS collars where they automatically take GPS fixes. And now they're GPS satellite collars, so every day they upload their location. So we have real time monitoring of where these caribou are. Also, if a caribou dies, it sends a mortality signal. I basically get an email that my office says, I am dead, and we then get to go in there and find out what killed it as quickly as possible. So based on that work, we've, uh, we've worked out the, uh, the pattern of habitat selection of these caribou. And these are the different herds that we recognize. So in the top right, we see the green herd, that's the Moberly caribou herd. The pink herd off to the left is the Scott herd. The red population is the Kennedy siding. The orange is the burnt pine. That purpley herd is the quintet herd. And we also have the narrowway herd that's broken up into two subgroups. The yellow one is the bear hole red willow, and we have the south narrowway. Now on this map, the winter locations are these darker triangles, so they appear to be darker. And the summer locations are just the pure colors. The general pattern of these guys is in the summertime, for calving and summer range, they often move into the fairly rugged central core of the Rocky Mountains. And that's where you're going to find them. But it's way too nasty out there in the middle of winter, so they tend to move out to the edges, either to the east or to the west. So you can see in the Moberly, they've all kind of pushed themselves off to the right-hand side, burnt pine, and, uh, and Quintet as well doing that. Now these three herds, when they move off to the east, they stay in the mountains and they use windswept alpine ridges. In contrast, the bottom two herds, the yellow and the green, these guys move right out of the mountains and right out onto the flat boreal plateau and feed in the forests at low elevations. On the other side, we've got the uh, Kennedy Siding Herd. It comes down to a low elevation winter range right around Mackenzie Junction, right where you turn off to uh, Mackenzie there, in the early winter, but then later in the winter they move back into the mountains. So this is the, the different herds, and by following them around, and looking at their habitat selection, we've been able to you know, sort of really get a good feeling for their habitat requirements. So again, what we see here in the wintertime is three different strategies. One is you can be up on these windswept alpine ridges, and what they're doing up there is finding ground lichens that are on the ground to eat. And because the wind has blown the snow off, they don't have to dig through the snow. You can also find them, though, just below that area into some of this forested, old-growth subalpine forest. The snow is too deep to dig for lichens there, so what they do is they eat the lichens off the trees. Or, like I said, in some cases they come right down to low-elevation pine forests where there's snow, but it's shallow enough that they're able to dig through the snow and feed on the terrestrial lichens. So this is the habitat requirements of these different caribou, and as I described, there's actually a fair difference between some of the different herds. So based on that information, we've created core habitat maps for these uh, different populations. So on the left here, this is the core high elevation winter range for the quintet caribou herd. 
so near Tumbler Ridge. So these are the areas that, based on the telemetry and the habitat selection for windswept ridges and old growth subalpine forests, this is the core habitat. Now when we put the radio telemetry locations in purple on top of that, you can see that in fact uh, that's basically where these caribou are living. And about 95% of the winter locations are actually then on these high elevation areas. And again, as you can see, like I pointed out, they really want to be out on these eastern edges. Uh, so when you get further back into the mountains, although it's still core high elevation winter range, you don't see nearly the same amount of use that you do right out on these outer ranges. Now there's a few exceptions to that. You can see this ridge here that's mapped as core high elevation winter range and the caribou don't use it. That's because these are areas that have been destroyed in the past by uh, mining. So this was where the Quintet mine was. This was the uh, the Mesa pit of the, trend, or of the Quintet mine, it's no longer functioning as caribou habitat. So mining activity up in this high elevation habitat effectively destroys the value of these areas for caribou. Now in terms of the population, these caribou are not at all doing well. So we don't have really good uh, population data from a long time ago, but when we started looking at these things about in the 1990s, we think there was about 800 to 1,000 caribou out there. So for example, we know there was over 200 caribou in the Moberly. By about 2015, there was down to about 23. Kennedy siding. About 2008, still had 120 caribou. A few years ago, it was down to 50. This is the burnt pine population. That population has now been extirpated. They're gone. Never was a real big population, about 20 caribou, but they just gradually kept declining over the past decade, and they are now extirpated. The quintet population, again, about 200 caribou in the early 2000s, got down into the 30s. The bear hole red willow population probably had about 100 in the 2008. They've just been declining, declining, declining. Uh, we now think they're effectively extirpated as well. That's a little harder to say, though, because they live down in the trees, and it's a lot harder to find them. And then finally, the South Narroway declined from about 200, and it's down to about 30 or 40. So overall, we've seen a population that just about 20, 25 years ago had 800 to 1,000 caribou, and by 2016, they were down to about 200. And the way that trend was going, these caribou would have been effectively gone by about 2020. So what's causing these caribou to decline? Well, the immediate cause of decline, or what we refer to as the proximate cause of decline, seems to be largely predation, and in particular, wolf predation. So like I said, these radio callers, when the caribou dies, we go out as quickly as possible and try to determine what killed it. And when we do that, we see that wolf predation is the major cause of mortality. We get a bunch of unknowns, but overall, of the known causes, 74% of the mortality is due to wolves. And this isn't unique to this area. As we look at caribou populations across North America that are in decline, it's largely due to excessive wolf predation. Go south in BC into the Kootenays, and the cougars start becoming a big deal. But over much of the range, we're talking about excessive wolf predation. <coughs> Now one of the odd things about this though is this is the food habits of the wolves. So we've studied radio collared wolves and we've gone into locations where they've made a kill to see what they've killed. And as you can see, they overwhelmingly rely on moose. In fact, caribou are a trivial part of their diet. So even though wolves are a big problem for caribou, caribou are 
almost irrelevant component of the, the wolf diet. The wolves, you know, they eat some deer, elk, and this and that. But by and large, the wolf population out there is sustained by moose. And this makes sense if you just know anything about the relative abundance of these guys. So if you were to take a thousand square kilometers out on this range, it would have about 30 caribou, about 10 wolves, and six or eight hundred moose. So obviously there's way more moose out there to sustain the wolf population than there is caribou. Now living at high elevations is a key to the survival of these caribou. This is work we did with radio collared wolves around uh, Humble Ridge again. So the green, that's that high elevation for our winter range, so that's where all the caribou are. But if you look at where the radio collared wolves are, they're all living down in the valley bottoms. In fact, only about 3% of wolf locations are up with caribou. The wolves are all down low in the winter time, living on moose. So this is why it's particularly important to protect and maintain the ability for these caribou to live at high elevations in the winter time, because if they can, and they have to move to lower elevations, they're going to be face to face with wolves, and the problem is going to be even worse. Now, if we take a look in the summertime, things change a bit, and now we start seeing the wolves are going up high and using a lot more high elevation habitat. And that's the time of the year when they're killing the adults and they're killing the caribou calves and causing the population to climb. So now we have this obvious question. So like, what's the deal here? I mean, moose and wolves and caribou and grizzly bears and everything else coexisted out here in this country for thousands of years. We didn't have the wolves driving the caribou to extinction. Why is it that just over the past few decades, all of a sudden we see these wolf populations effectively eliminating one of their historic natural prey species? And we believe it's related to industrial landscape change, which distorts the natural predator prey system. So if you go into an area of caribou habitat, and you start logging and road building and everything else, what you do now is change a landscape that used to have large contiguous areas of mature and old forest into an area that's got lots of young forests. And once those time blocks start to brush up, they become prime habitat for moose. So this is going to build up a moose population. And as you can see, or as you saw, these wolves are completely dependent on these moose. The wolf population is going to build up. And incidentally, they're just going to run into enough caribou to basically kill enough caribou to drive them to extinction. And it also doesn't help if you've got lots of roads and linear corridors and roads to the alpine, which just make it that much easier for the predators, particularly the wolves, to run around and find caribou to kill. So although the wolf predation is the proximate cause, or the immediate cause of the mortality, the ultimate reason is we're changing the landscape in a way that is no longer allows caribou to coexist with wolves. So what can we do about it? Well, there's a, a variety of choices. Unfortunately, none of them are nice. We can do wolf control. We can go out there and we are doing it and kill wolves. And if we kill wolves, that will benefit the caribou. Needless to say, wolf control is not very popular. It certainly has international attention that we're involved in wolf control. It's also expensive. And one of the problems, as I'll show you a bit later, is as long as there's lots of moose out there and lots of disturbed habitat, the wolves just keep coming back. So this is something that's not in any way a long-term solution. It's year after year after year. You're going to have to keep killing wolves. 
Another option is to actually provide a shelter for the caribou so they can avoid predators. And this is the idea that you know, we, the, the First Nations have used in the area using the maternity pens. There's also some proposals in Alberta that they'll be much larger fenced in predator free exposures to basically just shelter the predators or, or the caribou from the predators. Another possibility would be to reduce the moose population. Like we said, these wolves out there are almost completely dependent on moose. If there were less moose, there'd be less wolves. That, of course, again becomes problematic because people like moose. And the actual numerical reduction that would be required is pretty extreme. So, you know, like, like I said, right now, you know, there's often 600, 800 moose per thousand square kilometers out there. Once they start getting down to about 500, 400, people start complaining that there's not enough moose out there. To actually get them down low enough, if the wolves would start to starve out, you'd have to actually have them down to about 100. So about one moose per 10 square kilometers. That's pretty low moose density. But at that point, we would actually start seeing the wolves starting to starve over the system. Ultimately, you know, we need to protect and restore more habitat out there. That's probably the ultimate cause of these population declines. But of course, that comes with very, very major socioeconomic consequences. Both forestry, mining, oil and gas, and so on. And this is made particularly problematic because you see I've got these two words up here, core and matrix. So core habitat is like that high elevation habitat or some of these low elevation winter ranges where the caribou actually live. Okay, so that's clearly an important habitat to protect. But the problem is, even the areas around there where the caribou don't even live contribute to this, this distorted predator-prey system. So even if you protect all the high elevation habitat where the caribou live, the core habitat, logging in the matrix habitat down in the valley bottoms is still going to be generating this moose predator issue. So, those are some of the unpleasant or difficult to implement management options, but if you don't do that, you're effectively making a decision to let the caribou herds be extirpated. Because like I said, we were on a trajectory that if the wolf control program hadn't been started in this area, these caribou would be effectively gone within the next couple of years. So I'm going to walk through some of those because we've basically tried all of these things. So this is the Southeast Wolf Control Program. It includes the Quintet, the, uh, Mer the uh, Moberly, Kennedy Siding, and so on. The whole area is about 18,000 square kilometers. And government and government contractors go out there every winter in helicopters and try to shoot every wolf out there. This is the map from uh, the, this year here, and all the numbers indicate the number of wolves that were shot in those different areas. So the first year was a bit of a slow go, but then things really geared up, and 201 wolves were killed, 103 wolves were killed, 115 wolves were killed. I don't have the numbers for this year, but it's close to another 100 wolves have been killed. So it's kind of like I said, as long as the habitat conditions are conducive to wolves in those areas, every year they just keep coming back in. This is not a long-term solution unless you plan on killing wolves for the rest of the time. That said, it sure works. This is some data for before and after the wolf control. Before wolf control, we were getting almost 14% annual mortality. After the wolf control, it's down to 4.6. We were only getting about 16 calves. That's up to about 25. That's the period the herds were declining by about 15% a year. They're now increasing by about 20% a year. So wolf control certainly works. It's just that you need to be prepared to do it year after year after year. 
The other option we talked about is if they protected the caribou from predators. What we know is that a lot of calves die in the first few weeks of birth. When we catch them in the winter time and take a blood sample, do a progesterone analysis, like 95% of the adult females are pregnant. So they're giving birth to a calf. We go out and do a calf count in July, and only about half of them have a surviving calf. So half the calves have died within the first few weeks of life. Now that's a time where we're really vulnerable to just about everything. Bears and coyotes and eagles and wolves and wolverine and they fall in creeks and ground. They just die from everything. So the idea of the maternity then is to put them in a safe haven for a couple of weeks and take care of them. So these maternity pens, they sort of range depending on where you are, sometimes 8 hectares, 10 hectares, not very big, 12 hectares. They're fenced in, they use geofabric for fencing. The idea is you go up in March, capture the caribou up in the high elevation winter range, and bring them down and leave them in the pen. They give birth to their calves, there's no predators out there, there's some supplemental feeding of some high quality food, and most of those calves are going to survive, and then you can let them go when they're a little bit bigger. So this works, but boy oh boy, this is really intensive management. This is really disruptive to a natural wildlife population. Every year you grab them out of there, sticking them in a pan. It alters their natural movement patterns, and it's very expensive. In fact, it costs about $200,000 for every additional calf that you add to the population. So that little guy there is worth two grand, or 200,000, actually. And it doesn't come without risks. The Clean Z's offhand has been very, very successful. In contrast, the pen down in Revelstoke has had really high adult mortality. Lots of adults and calves actually dying in the pen. It's actually done more harm than good. So this is the technique that kind of works, but we really see this as a last ditch emergency for a really, really small population. So this was implanted in New Clint's Ezog, and that herd was down to 22 caribou. Nonetheless, in, at least in the short term, we've reversed some of these population declines. So the red line, the pine LPU, this is the Moberly and the Kennedy siding herd sort of lumped together. And as you can see, they're on this dramatic population decline until about 2014, when a combination of the maternity penning and the wolf control were implemented and have turned this herd around and it's now increasing. Similar to the quintet herd, was on this decline, but with the initiation of the wolf control, we don't have the latency in this data here. Uh, it's also starting to increase. Meanwhile, the narrowway herd, which doesn't have any active management, continues to decline. So at least in the short term, by implementing these intensive population management techniques, We've halted the decline, prevented the immediate extinction of these herds, and turned it around. Another option I talked about is the moose reduction. And this has been tried a couple times in the province, once in Revelstoke and also over in the Parsnip, just between Prince George and, uh, and Mackenzie. Now in Revelstoke, okay, these lines here, the blue ones, show the population reduction in moose. So by liberalizing moose hunting, they reduced the population of moose from about 1,600 down to less than 500. And sure enough, the wolf population declined accordingly. I mean, they really did reduce the moose to a low enough number that the wolves were starting to starve out of that system. Now in contrast, we didn't see this response in the parsnip because the moose reduction just wasn't severe enough to actually get them down to a number where the wolves are going to start starving. Like I said, you really need low, low moose densities out there before you're going to start seeing the, the, the wolves start to starve and disappear from the system. And then finally, you know, we've done a lot of habitat protection. I mean, people complain that the province 
hasn't done enough, but boy, compared to almost any other species, there's been a lot of habitat protection put in place for these caribou, particularly in terms of the forest industry. Uh, we have millions of hectares of unwood winter range set aside, not in the central mountains, but you know, throughout southern BC, to protect high elevation core habitat. So, and here in the southeast, these areas here, and these show the under the winter ranges on the high elevation caribou winter range that are unavailable for forest harvesting or road building. But it's clearly not enough because in the absence of predator management, all of these populations are continuing to decline. So if there's a lot of habitat protection out there, it's not enough. For one thing, it largely addresses forestry and doesn't deal with a lot of the other industries that it can also impact this high elevation core habitat. And the other problem, as I pointed out, is we always, in the past, used to focus on protecting core habitat. Now there's this recognition that even that matrix habitat, even the valley bottoms where the caribou don't even go, if you've got extensive industrial modification of that, it disrupts this predator-prey system and puts it in a situation where we've got declining caribou. So in summary, there's a variety of potential management options. We can do wolf control, we can have maternity pens, we can do moose reduction, we can do lots more habitat protection, but they're all extremely challenging and controversial. So don't be too hard on the government guys here. I mean, this is a real, real, real wicked problem to try to keep caribou in British Columbia, given this type of situation. And you know, individuals might think the answer from their point of view is simple, but the reality of it is when the government has to deal with a whole bunch of competing interests and values, trying to come up with a suite of management options that are going to recover caribou and still not be too offensive from these other points of view makes for a real, real difficult situation. So thank you for that. Apparently I'm taking questions. And thanks very much, Dale, for laying out the challenge. Um, so what we're going to start as I mentioned before, we just have the one mic, unfortunately. So we're going to work our way around. Sarah, we've got somebody right up here. Uh, yeah, well, we're going to work. Okay. Hello, Dale. Hi. Hey, uh, I noticed you didn't mention anything about uh, uh, global warming. You mentioned uh, logging blocks, seismic trails, but uh, nowadays we go minus and positive every day, and uh, wolves can access that. Okay, you, 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 that's a good, good point. Um, certainly in the background, global warming is making things worse for this. I mean, this is obviously an Arctic species, and anything that makes it more, the landscape more conducive to things like deer and elk and moose, it's just making it harder and harder for these animals to go. And I don't think it's any coincidence that we're seeing the herds in the very extreme south of BC disappear. So we've, just in the past year, we lost the South Selkirks and the South Purcells. As we move further north, these animals have a better chance of survival. But you're absolutely right that ongoing climate change and global warming is just going to make it harder and harder to keep them. And also the Graham Laureate. Um, did we not choose to not kill wolves in the Grey Laurier Park and their population went down 56% and there's no backcountry access or logging in there? Uh, you're right. They, uh, it, it's up for, you know, getting the first wolf control program, I assure you, was a, a real challenge. I mean, there was very little appetite in government to do that. As we're starting to do the South Peace and people are seeing the positive success of that, there's more and more proposals on, on, on the board there to start considering other areas as well, including the Graham. Okay, thank you. We work in a way, so 
We all love the caribou, but I gotta ask. Um, this question comes from my 15 year old daughter. We can live without the caribou, but why no attention with the bees? With the bumblebees, the bees? Ah. Humankind ain't gonna live long after the bees die away, but we can make it without caribou. I'll take that as a comment instead of the question. Uh, I'm a trapper down uh, Tumba Ridgeway and I got a lot of uh, of the area down on the Murray River and one thing I'd like to know is uh, as you've said the uh, the killing of the wolves is helping the caribou not ever have I been approached to to help in some way with catching of wolves like uh, if you guys were to make it so that it was worth a trapper's while because wolves are a difficult animal to trap and uh, and very time consuming etc if if it was made it worth while for registered trappers we could probably really help out with wolf predation and uh, and it'd be a heck of a lot cheaper than helicopters I'm quite sure of that In that uh, map I showed of where the wolves were removed that year, there actually was a significant portion of those wolves were taken by First Nations trappers or in, in the Quinzeza around the pen. Um, one of the, so, so certainly that can be part of the answer. Absolutely, uh, that could be part of it. We still believe though we would need the aerial gunning for a cleanup because there's all sorts of, you know, these guys are in some pretty, rugged sort of difficult areas to get to and uh, again the problem with this wolf control is like you know it doesn't do any good to go out and kill a third of them or a half of them or even 60 percent of them we're basically needing to almost kill every wolf out there so you, it, it it may be a good good idea to try to you know enhance some of the hunting and trapping to contribute to that but uh, ultimately I still think we need the, the, the helicopters to, to do be effective enough to actually get them down. Maybe once the populations are built back, built back up then something like that would work but at this point in time we really need to be incredibly effective at getting most of them out there. Well yeah I, I can agree with you that uh, as a trapper or you know a few trappers we can't do what the helicopters are doing but we can definitely help. Like, uh, I have probably more than 50 kilometers of Murray River on my trap line. And like I say, not once ever since the, the wolf program started has anybody ever mentioned anything to me about, uh, hey, what are you doing or would you like to help out? Sounds good. couldn't hear, hear that at all, we're trying to get that mic fixed. Or you can come up. Hi, I have a simple question. Why aren't the ranchers around here being asked to raise some caribou? They do a good job raising the cattle, and I'm sure they're more than capable of raising a few hundred caribou to help increase the herds.
So maybe I'll introduce myself now too, and I'm the next speaker, but um, I'm Darcy Peel, I'm the director of the Caribou Recovery Program, and captive breeding is something that we're exploring. Whether it is uh, using uh, ranchers or, or some other form, it, it's definitely part of the discussion right now. You got the mic fixed yet? Check. It's a fix, okay. There's the gentleman uh, right there, yeah. No. My question is, <laughs> my question is the moose population. Oh. My question is, the moose population, do we have any numbers to see that? I know as an avid hunter back in 2006 we had record lows, uh, water table level. And then we had a harsh winter where we had lots of freezing, warming up, lots of snow, and it killed, I know in all the places I hunt, almost the entire moose population. I see on our chart here that the caribou numbers went down in that 2006 area. So I'm kind of curious, if we get rid of the wolves, or the moose, did we not already do that, or didn't the, the climate do it back in 2006? Yeah, I, I don't, I, I personally am not involved in the moose survey. Certainly the region does periodic moose surveys. I think a lot of people know that across central BC there seems to have been a decline in moose, but it's all kind of relevant. There's a decline in moose from what there was a decade or so, so before that, there's a decline in moose that's problematic if you're a hunter and you want to lots of moose out there, but relative to this predator-prey system, there's still way, way more moose than that are going to sustain a, a wolf population that's still way too many for these caribou to get along with. So it's kind of a continuum here. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, I don't have that, but I know that you know the regional biologists in Fort St. John, they certainly have done a number of wolf or moose population surveys around here in the past four or five years. Just gonna do a quick check here, sorry. Uh, we might get this working. Mic check. Here we go. Okay. Thank you. I actually have two questions. The first is, I think many of us are concerned when you say we think we know numbers. I think we would want to be assured that you caribou, this is not a new conversation. This is a 70 year old conversation. It's very concerning when we hear we think we know numbers or we think they're declining. So do you actually know or don't? Number one. I, I say, I'm not sure I said that actually. I'm not quite sure what all the applause is for. We do definitely know that these populations are dramatically declining. Um, we go out, we do aerial surveys, we've got a marked sample of the population, we know what proportion, you can correct it, you can then calculate the, uh, the confidence intervals around that. There's definitely no doubt they're dramatically declining. Obviously, you know, counting a wild animal out there and, and has some variability around it. It's not totally precise, but there's absolutely no doubt that there's been like an 80% reduction in the population over the past 20, 30 years. And I think our concern as residents is that you are talking about shutting down large amounts of industry in our area. I don't think I actually suggest You haven't, but certainly the document has. Okay. Uh, and I 
think we're very concerned that the decisions that you are making are based on sound science, and I'm not sure that we agree with your science. Number one. Number two is uh, we have, we are wondering why you're not doing a multi-species approach when you're talking about ungulates, deer, moose, all of those populations, elk, uh, as a part of that when you're talking about predation, you're talking about habitat, etc. Um, because we know that the Sara conversation is more than just hair. We know that there are more uh, species at risk in British Columbia than any other province in the country. So we know that this is just the beginning of a very long conversation in British Columbia. So why are you not looking at all species instead of just one? And thank you. Well, I think that they all outlined uh, uh, pretty well that in order to recover caribou, we need to manage the landscape. And that in itself involves all the species that are out there. So that, that we've, we've changed the predator-prey dynamic by through the actions and, and the changes that we've put on the landscape. And then in order to recover caribou, there's a number of things we need to do on the, the in the herd areas that we're we're working on recovering, and so it's it's not one thing; it's a whole bunch of things, and it will affect other species as well. There's no doubt. Okay, folks. Uh, any last questions for for Dale? Uh, like we're looking for questions of clarification here. Be lots of chances for input in a second. Yes, sir. Can you come up with the water frequency building? First of all, Dale, that was uh, good information. I think you're very passionate about what you believe in. On, your sec on the second slide, there was a comment that said, we want to seek first to understand and then be understood. But I think we're missing the point here because you made a comment about social economical study. And if we have that, I'd love to see it this afternoon. Um, you know, what, what has been done to show the impact? Um, do you, on, on protecting these areas up in the Alpine, um, Wes Fraser uh, has invested $150 million in this community into our operation. We generate uh, about $34 million a year in economic uh, um, support for this community. We have a $24 million payroll. And the numbers that we've been provided with as a company, from, from originally from the government, suggests that one mill is going to go down because of the impact of protecting these areas. That's 500 jobs. And we talk about um, billing and hunting. If we don't have jobs in this community, there will be no none of that going on. And I'd just like to know if, you, if we have a social economical study being done, where is that information? And we'd sure like to see it. And if it is done, will we be presented the opportunity to provide feedback uh, and respond with, you know, 30 days. I can't get my license in 30 days, let alone get a, a, a response on this stuff. Thank you. So the socioeconomic analysis that to date has been, has been pretty tightly controlled, as you know, uh, but the um, the draft agreements are now part of a socioeconomic analysis, which the terms of reference were just shared with the Peace River Regional District and the communities today, I believe. So that contract hasn't been let, but it, it is it is in the works. So I, a totally important piece of work. We we get that when we certainly understand the community's need for that sort of information and in moving forward. Uh, but also remember that we haven't had agreements to analyze until now. Wouldn't it have made more sense to involve the community in that, in that analysis? Well, that's what we're doing right now. No, we're coming to you with draft agreements to discuss with the communities. Those, those agreements weren't stable until just very recently. And 
you know, the parties to the agreement, they didn't have anything to discuss until they were stable. I think uh, people are interested to get into the agreement, so I think what I'm going to do, if I may, is move on, give you a little bit more information on, we've heard from Dale on what the extent and nature of the challenge is. Let's talk a little bit about what's being done in addition to what Dale said with the Provincial Recovery Program. So Darcy's going to tell you a little bit about that, and then we'll get into the agreements, believe me. So maybe just before I start, there's about probably 20 or 30 seats up at the front. If people at the back want to come up, there's lots of room. No? Don't be shy. So, we've heard lots about my character reporting and, and clearly the community feels that way. You can tell by the turnout tonight. You can tell by the questions we've heard. You know, caribou are important, they're iconic in Canada, they're on our border. They're, they're, there's lots of, we don't, we don't need to know or further information why caribou are important to Canadians. Uh, the legislative reason, or the sort of the legal reason, is there are designated species under the Species at Risk Act of Canada. BC doesn't have its own standalone stand species at risk legislation. We're governed by the Can Canadian Species at Risk Act. Canada developed a recovery strategy for Southern Mountain Caribou. We need to take action based on that uh, recovery strategy. As Dale described, they, they require large chunks of contiguous habitat. Fragmented habitat or changes in that habitat from old to young have uh, detrimental impacts on caribou populations. They're clearly vulnerable to wolf predation. We've demonstrated that. We've nailed that. The science on that is indisputable. They're clearly sensitive to human disturbance through a number of uh, you know, the industrial changes to the landscape, but other things as well. I think Dale described this piece pretty well as well, as well, that caribou occur in places that are important to us, whether it be recreationally, uh, industrially, forestry and mining, they're, they're in places that, that people in communities like Chapman, Tumbler Ridge, Williams Lake, Cornell, are, their lives are dependent on those areas. Caribou are also utilizing those same areas. They have high significance, or their value is significant to, to First Nations in these communities as well. And in this particular area, there's a treaty that, between the government of Canada and the governments of the First Nations, the, the signatories to Treaty 8, that obligate both parties to do certain things. So the, this map just just uh, further explores what Dale went through. You can see the distribution of caribou from historically from the U.S. border right up to the Yukon. Uh, the caribou that we're we're most interested in tonight are the ones that are inside the black line, and in particular the ones that are in orange there. So there's roughly 15, 16,000 caribou remaining in BC. That's down from a from a a high or a recent high of probably around 40,000 in the 80s. So quite a precipitous de decline, and the decline is worse at the southern edge and least at the northern edge. Same slide. <laughs> so, uh, in response to the, the development of the, the, speaker, the um, Caribou Recovery Plan by Canada, BC had, had to, you know, to, had to respond in some way and say, here's what we're doing in order to address the concerns that were brought up through, through that recovery planning process. Prior to 
to uh, February of 2017, BC's approach was driven by regional priorities, that there was work done by, by bi biologists across the province on caribou management, and, and lots of caribou recovery type work, but it was coordinated regionally. The thought was that uh, in order to, to tackle this most appropriately, we had to develop a province-wide caribou recovery plan, and that's what we've done. Uh, announced originally to be three years, now it's five years, uh, developed to, per to one, recover populations of identified caribou herds, to provide certainty to natural resource users across the province, uh, to advance collaboration and reconciliation with Aboriginal groups across the province, to collaborate with community partners, the, the communities that are affected by caribou recovery, and to actively engage in processes like this. And so we're continuing to do these things. Uh, several of them are, you know, they're, they're fairly new, but uh, these are the, the program goals and objectives that we, we have across the province. So I think, If we have time, I can take a couple of questions. It took planning to do it. 
Years ago, people were involved here on the Dawson Creek Land Resource Management Plan. All the various sector organizations were involved. People talked from uh, various perspectives. You worked through a process of a couple of years. What I heard in this discussion is a lack of that. When we talk about caribou planning, people might say whether it's bees or whether it's climate warming, it might concern that an overdays watershed. We see watershed impacts from extreme events. And when you put it through different filters, you start to get solutions. You start to see, well, maybe if this critical area was really to make a difference around protection or restoration or accommodation, we could put a lot of energy put people to work doing it too. So I really ask the question, and it's a question for the Assistant Deputy Minister for the Dimension Group. Are we going to get to a point where we can actually bring this into this, this framework of a land use planning table so that we're not just trying to react to one issue after another? But looking at it as I think people are saying, it's a number of interests and needs. And I just put that up because I think we're going to just be polarized all the way. We want to get there and be working with communities for sure. Um, we're, we're in a little bit of a weird position with the partnership agreement and the section 11 and getting that across the finish line or the, the draft finish line so that we can come to you know, the public and say, here's a product that we think can help to recover caribou in this area. Let's get your input into that so we take it to the decision makers to say, okay, what, how, how do we move this forward? But on the specific recovery planning, you know, more on the granular scale with, with caribou recovery on a, at a herd level, definitely we want to be in, in, in early with communities talking about what's possible, what makes sense, what doesn't. Uh, we, I certainly hear you on that. Hi, Darcy. How are you doing? Uh, I guess uh, I'm kind of concerned about, first of all, you, you talked a little bit about terms of reference that, to, on socioeconomic stuff. That I guess we've seen a rough draft of those that we're going to meet with some people uh, from the ministry tomorrow. Um, certainly, from what I have seen, it's got a lot of work need to be done on it. Um, the other part of this is uh, I'm really concerned about a, a draft agreement that uh, we're supposed to comment on that's so lacking in detail and actually what we're going to do. You guys have made some specific recommendations. Dale's made some, has talked about different tools that are out there, but very few of those tools and how they'll be used or defined in any of these agreements that you've put out there in my mind. Um, I've read them and, and I find them almost incoherent for, for somebody, I guess, at my level of, of education or knowledge on it. I think that. Uh, to stuff this into a six-week process is, is actually an insult to the people in this room when it could affect their, their very lives, um, their economic viability, their homes, their kids. Um, I guess the one thing I would ask is as you gather this information, to keep that in mind and uh, take this message back to your bosses, the ministers, that we got to have time to do this. Uh, right now, our First Nations have more time to review cutting permits one cutting permit that we're getting to review this document. And uh, it's not adequate, it's not enough. We have to do better. Okay, thanks, Dan. Um, I'm gonna ask David Muter uh, to give you just a little bit more information on the socioeconomic study that's uh, being under development. So, thank you. Um, I'm David Muter. I'm uh, with the Ministry of Forests. Um, and I appreciate the question. That's, that's why we're here, is to hear the feedback, hear these questions, uh, and hear some of the ideas that are coming from the, the folks here. Uh, as to regards to the economic impact, uh, we do know that that's a really important piece of work that needs to get done as part of this engagement process. Um, in order to do that, uh, to do an economic impact, you have to have an outline of what is going to be impacted a stable agreement, a stable draft of the agreement. The next thing you need to have to do is an agreement with the folks uh, that are going to be reviewing this of how to do that economic impact. And we're at that place right now. We've got a stable draft. 
We've got a draft set of terms of reference that we've shared with folks in the Peace River Regional District. We want input. We want your ideas on how to complete this economic analysis and do that work uh, to inform how we're doing this together going forward. So it's really valuable to hear these thoughts and ideas and that economic impact analysis is part of what we're going to be doing through this engagement process here. Thanks, David. Okay, we'll take a few minutes more questions on the, on the Caribou Recovery Programs and then you're dying. I know to get into the agreements and provide your input, so I want to get us there soon. So if I may get these three gentlemen's questions, then let's get a little bit of information on the agreements and then we'll get the direct input on all that you want to, want to say. So, sir, go ahead. Okay, this is again uh, towards Dale. You're saying that killing the moose reduced the population of the wolves, and they were just the numbers would go down. Don't you think, sir? Can you speak a little closer to the mic? Oh, sorry about that. This is towards Dale, saying that you know by killing the moose, the wolf population went down, right? Yep. And it just magically they just the numbers just went down, right? That's what you were saying. I didn't say they magically went well, down. Now they reduced, right? They it down. Don't you think the wolves have legs and they just moved on to the next place? They moved on to the next place where there's a higher population of moose, deer, and elk, annihilated them. Sure, your numbers went down where you're doing your study, but I know that in by uh, Vanderhoof, Hudson Hope, Prince George area, I, I I seen the numbers just plummet rapidly in the in the last eight eight years or so. It's, and I personally think by you killing the moose up here, you're not solving the problem, you're just moving the, the problem to another court. Personally, myself. But I might be wrong. Next gentleman. If. Uh, caribou are so endangered, why are we hunting them north of Fort St. John? 742. That's only 250-300 K away from here. You guys are talking an area that's how big you're going to shut down while well, those like, I don't know, we're still hunting them up north. Yeah. So the, the gentleman brought up the fact that there, there does remain a couple of caribou hunts up along the, the Yukon BC border. Uh, those caribou are not listed as threatened. They are uh, special concern herds. Those hunts are being looked at. Uh, the three remaining southern mountain caribou herds that, are, that were hunted though those hunts were closed recently, and some of you probably had heard that. Uh, the minister made that decision in December. So, uh, it, it, it's just factual information. And there's another. Yes, go ahead, sir. Uh, so at the risk of sounding callous, my question is, um, for the smaller population groups, uh, isn't there a point where they're no longer genetically viable or the inbreeding would be too severe? And if that's the case, uh, has there been any attempt made to triage funding? So $200,000 a calf is a pretty penny for a group a herd that may not survive in the future. It's, it's an interesting discussion point. Dale, do you want to address the, the sort of size of herd and the conservation viability? But the, the, the point around the, the viability of a herd, you know, sort of gets to a point where we're sort of, it, 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 it's just not viable, any, viable anymore. We certainly are having those conversations. Yeah, I, I think you're right that uh, there's certainly some herds that are simply too small or the situation is just, Recovery isn't an option. So for example, the burnt pine herd up there, like I said, they went, you know, there's sort of like no inclination to sort of reintroduce them. We had the George Mountain herd go extinct just near Prince George. Just recently, the two herds south of, in the, south of Cranbrook, South Purcells, and uh, you know, you're absolutely right. That said, I mean, the, uh, the uh, Clinziza or the, uh, 
from Oberly herd. I mean, that range has the potential to support a couple hundred caribou. And at the rate they're growing, with the wolf control, you know, we're going to be back up to a couple hundred caribou out there within a few years. Again, the issue though is that the only thing that's keeping them there is the ongoing wolf control. So that's, you know, we're just asking, you know, what kind of choices do people want to make? Do we, are people prepared to have ongoing wolf control in perpetuity? <laughs> that's really interesting, but you know what would happen if I asked that same question in downtown Vancouver? I know you don't care, but... Um, hey, uh, you should probably give him a chance to answer, right? But at the risk of talking about you know, where Sorry. I come from, Vancouver, um, yeah, it's true, people in Vancouver would be opposed to it, but it isn't the act of the government to, you know, uh, help the citizens' lives. So if you're only focusing on one area, is that really representing all the citizens of British Columbia, or is that just focusing on a special interest group that can get the most voters for the government in charge? Okay, I, what we're going to do then is do some short presentations on the agreement. So then we can get into that as well as other questions you may have. So first up is going to be Sue Melbourne, an Assistant Deputy Minister from the Canadian Wildlife Service. And then David Muter, who you just met, and then we'll finish with Russ LaRoche. So Sue, over to you. So I think you're already getting into the details and so I won't take a lot of time talking about the Species at Risk uh, legislation, but essentially the Species at Risk Act is federal legislation that's designed to protect and recover wildlife species like the caribou. And it's designed to work with uh, provincial legislation. It has a variety of tools uh, and requirements to do its job, including things like Section 11 agreements or like the recovery strategy, which uh, lays out what a species needs in order to uh, recover. One of the tools in the toolkit for the Species at Risk Act is an emergency order. And if the minister believes that either the survival or the recovery of a species like caribou is imminently threatened, uh, then she must uh, make that uh, finding and then she must make a order or a regulation she must recommend that to the federal cabinet. And then the federal cabinet needs to decide what it wants to do. So the minister must recommend an order and that order is a pretty blunt instrument that essentially prohibits things. It would shut down activity on the landscape. And there would be some options uh, there, but it would, it would be a pretty blunt instrument. The federal cabinet, however, has a whole range of, of uh, options of what it can look at, uh, and uh, it can take into account socioeconomic uh, information in what the federal cabinet decides to do. What we're hearing uh, today about what caribou need are things like predator control, restoration, maternal penning, uh, and some of these things that, that uh, the science has shown are effective uh, are, are the kinds of things that are being talked about in the partnership agreement and in the section 11 agreement. So uh, these are real alternatives that the uh, federal cabinet can consider uh, when it's making its decision about what it wants, uh, what it's going to do. So it could be looking at things beyond kind of a blunt tool that stops activity. They could be looking at uh, factoring in socioeconomic information, factoring in some of the other measures uh, that, you, that, that could be put in place that, that don't come from a law. So um, that's, that's really the, the Species at Risk Act, and um, I think I'll pass the microphone on now to talk about some of the details in, in the agreements, which would be good alternatives for the federal cabinet to consider. Thank you, Sue. 
So as Sue mentioned, the protection order under the Species of Risk Act, that's a very coarse tool, it's one tool. And collectively, me, BC, and Canada think that a Section 11 agreement is a better tool to use. Um, section 11, that refers to the section within the Species of Risk Act that allows the federal government and other governments to enter into an agreement for uh, protection and restoration um, uh, activities for a species. And so, I'll tell you a bit about the Section 11 agreements. Um, it's between BC and Canada. Um, its scope covers uh, the BC herds of southern mountain caribou that are identified with the federal coverage strategy. And so it's that area on the map that's outlined in gray. So all those southern mountain caribou herds are in BC. Um, it's between BC and Environment and Climate Change Canada as a draft agreement. And it outlines the key principles, broad recovery actions that BC and Canada are going to undertake uh, to recover southern mountain caribou populations. Um, it's what I would describe as a framework agreement. Um, it sets out uh, certain elements that are very helpful uh, for caribou recovery. Three-year funding commitment from Canada to support the activities, as well as a very detailed annex that outlines current activities and future planned activities that will be undertaken for caribou recovery in BC. Um, the benefits of this agreement that we see um, are that it's a positive collateral approach to caribou recovery in BC. It fits with BC's caribou recovery program and Canada's uh, uh, recovery strategy. Um, and as Sue mentioned, this can be considered by the federal government as one of these more nuanced, more targeted tools rather than just a, a protection order uh, that would come from, uh, from the species of this guy. It gives us, as I mentioned, access to federal funding to support the implementation of this agreement. Um, and it demonstrates a strong stance on species of risk recovery. And as I mentioned, it's aligned with our federal recovery, uh, our provincial uh, caribou recovery program as well. So that's the section 11 agreement. And you know, we're here to share information about these agreements. Um, we're going to go on and talk about now the partnership agreement and share some information on that. And then we'll have more room for questions and answers. So this is uh, Russell Roche, who's Director of Strategic Initiatives with the Ministry of Forests, Planning and Recovery. Good evening, everyone. So David was just talking about the Section 11 agreement, which is, like you said, that gray area. So most of the problems are a good portion of it. I'm going to talk about the partnership agreement, which is probably something you're more interested in. And it's uh, in this area here, basically. The, the central designatable unit, the pine, the narrowing, and the tech. Um, so the parties of the, this agreement, the section 11 is Canada and BC. This agreement includes Canada and BC, but also West Bowman and Soto First Nations. Um, the purpose of the agreement is it sets out commitments that the parties are, are being implemented to stabilize and grow a self-sustaining population of uh, central group, Southern Mountain Territory. So um, bring back to the area to the self-sustaining population. It's, that's a that's a lofty goal. Um, why West Bowman and Soto First Nations? That question has come up before, um, and, and the answer is largely is because they're already doing a lot of things with their management in this area, specifically in that phase of the mine population unit. So they they have the maternal plan. Um, they've been doing groundwater management, uh, some some planning work and habitat management. Um, and despite their, their treaty rights and their First Nation rights, they, they impose a self, self imposed and more than care for my team in that area for a very long time. Um, they also have some companies associated with their recovery, um, restoration company and, and plant nursery, and I believe they also have another company associated with restoration that they're, uh, they're just getting started right now. So, what's in the agreement? And, and it's a big, long document. I think you guys have all seen it. It's on the website. Um, but the, the meat and potatoes of the agreement are the high elevation habitat protection. And I'm going to go through a bit, a bit of that in a second. Also, there's other protection in that high uh, local population unit. Um, and then it, it establishes this committee, a careful recovery committee, that reviews applications, development applications in those areas. For, uh, for forestry mining and those types of things, and provides a recommendation to a decision maker on, on whether they're, the plans considered here and, and the impact and mitigating measures of those. 
and then also it uh, sets out a framework for further uh, land use objectives, regulatory measures that would um, guide development in those areas in, within the partnership community. And then it has some implementation on the different for this stuff. I'm not going to really into it. So this is probably the most important slide you want to see tonight. Um, and it talks about uh, the protections within the, the partnership agreement. And so I'm going to walk through these. The A2, the B2, all of that stuff, that's just terminology into the agreement. Um, so you heard Dale talk about high elevation habitat and the importance of that. The blue area there is uh, all high elevation habitat. And so the, the agreement talks about an interim moratorium on the new development applications in that area. So that's, that's probably the, the largest protection in the agreement. Um, the, the green areas here are other habitat protection areas. So right in the middle there, that's the existing days apart. Um, the, the area called B2, which is this kind of stomach shaped thing there, um, was a previous commitment that the government had to, with Soto First Nations and a, a memorandum of understanding with Western Indian First Nations for expansion of that Clinton's Park. The B3 area, um, and so this reference again to the chapel, this is a clear water drainage area for those that know the area. Um, that's also some uh, proposed interim protection of habitat in that area. And then, uh, and then we have these other areas, the, the A1, which is uh, kind of dispersed through here. There's little blobs through here. And that's in the high elevation habitat. It's not protection, but uh, it's what we're calling a sustainable resource activity area. So within those areas, there might be a bit more constraints or requirements on mitigation strategies, impact assessments, and also applications in those areas would go through what the, the Care Board Recovery Committee mentioned earlier. So that committee will review those applications against what's legislatively required, mitigation strategies, and then provide a recommendation to the decision maker um, for those applications on whether those applications are consistent with the, 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 the legal objectives, but also the Care Board Recovery in general. And that would include these B areas too, so this yellow hash in the on the map. B4 is this area right here, and uh, it's very similar to the A1 and B1 area, so it's, it's an activity area, but in that area there's a special focus on conservation and recovery, so likely uh, maybe some other restrictions in that area on, on some development, but also extra effort and funding for uh, restoration activities. And then B5 is in the agreement, but not really related to the care for recovery, and it's a, an area that uh, West Mobile has identified as a uh, future location they would like for a First Nation Woodlands license. So the First Nation Woodlands license is a commitment that government has made for West Mobile First Nations. Um, that's just the area they identified they would like to see that First Nation license. So I, I know there's, a, there's been a bunch of discussion around motorized recreation and what does the partnership agreement mean for motorized recreation. The agreement itself doesn't really have much on motorized recreation. It's one clause in the agreement, um, I forget the exact wording, but it's more or less implement plan to review motorized recreation in this area. And so that's what we're going to do. And, and, um, it's, it's, so it's not in the agreement itself, but it's going to be done just after some of the engagements we're doing here. Um, and, and what we're going to be looking to do in May is just start meeting with the communities, um, with the stakeholder groups, and start to understand uh, where the high volume regulation areas are for, for snowmobiles in particular, because that's the one that has the greatest impact on caribou. Um, and understand where the high volume areas are for caribou, bring those two discussions together, and likely implement some closures in some of those areas. That map we just saw through this, that's not what we're looking for, is closures. I know there's been some discussions around that, but within the area, there might be will be some closures as, a, as an outcome in the decision making and that decision in the future. Um, but we definitely want to have that engagement process, uh, and there'll be future opportunities to uh, further engage on that. So the outcomes of that uh, are basically looking at balanced solutions that affects uh, there, but also respects the importance of snowmobiling values. Um, identify some management options and tools that we can use to 
um, with regards to the right recreation, um, and the ethnic closures are our likely outcome there. Um, in conjunction with that, we're looking for areas that we might be able to, uh, to invest some money to enhance. So potentially you'll be removing access to one area, but we're going to bring funding to the table to, to enhance uh, access or features in that area for, to maybe improve it for, for new use. Um, and then uh, the office outcome is just some more you know, direction to the snowmobile clubs and some certainty around where they can go. The last slide, I think, is just on this engagement and next steps. We didn't really discuss this. Do you want to do this, Dave? Thank you. And then I think we'll have some questions right after this. Thanks, Russ. I'll come to this in a second. But uh, I think uh, here's an opportunity now to get more input from you. You've heard a little bit more. Uh, from the agreements. So again, I'm going to have to uh, invite you to come to the front. Sarah's holding the mic. We apologize for our technical issues, but if you do want to ask a question or provide some input related to what you've heard so far, please come to the front and, uh, and give us your input. Thank you. Marilyn? Oh, check. Thank you. I'd like to know what the connection is between the proposed socioeconomic impact analysis, or the, the one that's in the works, and the maps that we see here in the, uh, uh, in the agreement with uh, Soto and West Moberly. Because as I look at it, I, I, I can come to some fairly solid conclusions on my own. I'd like to hear what yours are. So your question, what's the relationship between the maps, the zones, and how? Right, if I, as I read the maps, I don't see a whole lot of uh, room left to maintain the type of uh, life that we are experiencing today. Okay, so it, it, great question, and uh, that's exactly what we want to be looking at when we work with local governments to finalize how we'll do that social economic analysis. The zones on the map identify areas that are going to be uh, interim moratoriums, uh, protected areas, as Russ laid out, and that'll have an impact. And we want to work with local governments, communities, to understand how do you measure that? How do you assess what that impact will be? And that'll be part of the work we'll be doing over the next uh, few weeks. Uh, we'll be asking an independent firm to do an economic analysis using an approach that we look at and we all agree upon to look at those zones and determine what is that economic impact. So yes, it's a great question and, and I, I'm not going to answer that myself. I want to work with communities to figure out how to best answer that. Yep, next question, thanks. Um, I'm, I promised my husband I wouldn't speak tonight, so <laughs> he's going to want to kill me, but... Well, you're on TV. Yeah. First, I wanted to say, you know, I don't think there's a person in this room that has any interest in seeing the caribou just disappear. Um, but, um, you know, we all have a concern. You're talking about a couple hundred caribou and over 5,000 people. And it's not just about jobs, it's about the life that we live. I am going to address you personally. I found your comment about Vancouver extremely insulting. Um, it's like the only intelligent, capable people live in Vancouver. And all of us people up here, like, once you get past, I don't know, the past Prince George, maybe a little bit more south, that suddenly we don't give birth to live young, and we have no intelligence, and we have no capabilities, and what we do and what we sacrifice for the quality of lives that people live elsewhere doesn't matter. I mean, how many people have you asked in downtown Vancouver would wait an hour, two hours, maybe a day or two for an ambulance to take their child to a care facility? Right? But that's something that we have to on a daily basis up here. So we do make a lot of sacrifices because when you consider, like, I want to, one of my questions is, you talked about resource users. Who do you mean when you say that? Do you mean, like, the industries? Or do you mean the people in Vancouver who get SkyTrain that comes off of electrical power that comes from the dams up here, right? Or, you know, who heat their houses with the gas that comes from up here? Like, 
it's okay for all, all of us to be up here to work hard and do all these things, yet we have, uh, it's not even comparable to the kind of education my kids get to the kind that the kids in downtown Vancouver do. And if you don't think I know, well, I'm sorry, I lived in Vancouver for 15 years. I lived in Calgary for three years. I've lived all over the province in small towns and big towns, and we're here to work and do what we can. So for you to say that, you knew you were coming into a contentious facility when you came here. And it's great that you're passionate about it, but to insult us like that, that, that just doesn't show any higher level of education to me. So. Anyways, sorry. Um, the next thing is, okay, so if we're prepared to sacrifice for the caribou and we've got to do these things and this is the decision that's going to be made, will it work? How long is it going to take to work? And when is someone going to determine that it is not working? You know, do how, what? And then finally, you know, you put ahead $200,000 ahead for a calf. Well, there's five people in my family. $200,000 each is a million dollars. That would go to putting down a fairly decent deposit on a house in Vancouver, and then it's not my problem anymore. So maybe one thing that I could uh, provide a bit of information is, you know, do we know if this is working? That's a good question. Um, within both the Section 11 agreement and the partnership agreement, there's uh, a bunch of commitments to provide annual reporting on the effectiveness of the measures. So that information will be shared publicly. Um, it'll be part of what is envisioned in these draft agreements. Uh, next question. I'm Lilia Hansen, Acting Mayor of City of Fort St. John and Alternate Director of the Peace River Regional District. These comments are mine, but these are things that I'm hearing from my neighbours. You are my neighbours. Chatwind is our neighbour. We're concerned about what's happening here. I'd like to say thank you first. Thank you for coming. We've been waiting a while to have these conversations with respectful dialogue, so I do thank you for coming. Um, and I do applaud you for your strong stance for species at risk. Um, I am concerned though with your definition of parties to the agreement. I feel that uh, discussions should also include your, the communities in the Peace Re Regional District. Just because the areas we're talking about may not be within my city boundaries, they affect our residents. They work and play in the areas that are, are being affected by this agreement. And by talking to your community leaders in the Regional District, we can offer direct viewpoints from our citizens. We have their ear. We talk to them at the grocery store, down the street, in the coffee shops. We live in the north because we love the lifestyle and we respect the harmony needed between industry, backcountry, recreation, and wildlife. My ask is to have the consultation period extended to allow the communities, possibly the Peace River Regional District, to obtain an independent socio-economic report we respect that you are preparing one. We would like to have an opportunity for one as well. Uh, <laughs> conservation, protection, and stewardship of our land needs to be balanced with economic impacts. And my ask is for you, please, give us a little bit more time so the people of the north can help you with the planning. We want to see it succeed. We want to see the caribou, but we also want to have jobs. I love the animals, but people need to work. We're going to have animals, and then we're going to have people losing their homes and not have jobs. That's not where our province wants. That's not what the government wants. The government wants to see our province succeed and prosper. Please let us partner with you to make that possible. Question in the partnership agreement that speaks to a, uh, what, a caribou recovery committee, which consists of the federal government, the provincial government, Soto, and West Norway. There is no local government, there are no local stakeholders. Those three groups make all of the four groups make all of the decisions around land management in that map. Why is local government and stakeholders like industry not included in those decisions?
So good question. Um, the decision making still remains in the same place it always has in those cases. So um, in the case of cutting permits, it would rest with the district manager. What that group does is provides a, a recommendation to those decision makers on whether the, the decision is consistent with the, the values of of the, the agreement or the, the, the caribou recovery objectives that are in place. Um, According to this document, they can make arbitrary decisions within that land mass. No, they don't make decisions. They just make a recommendation. I, I can review it with you if you like and just make sure. Um, but on top of that, so provincial government will be there and, and West Morgan and Soto and the federal government for sure. The, the members on those groups are defined in the agreement, but who the, who the, the provincial reps would be talking to to help inform those decisions, it could include uh, the communities and whatnot, depending on what the decision is. Yeah, it, and, and it depends on what the decision would be, and sometimes it would make sense to, and sometimes it may not, depending on what we're talking about, for sure. Yep. Next question. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Leah McQueen. I'm here on behalf of the Four Wheel Drive Association of British Columbia. Um, you talked a little bit about consulting with snowmobile enthusiasts and snowmobile clubs a few minutes ago, but when you look at page six of the Provincial Caribou Recovery Program Overview, it does talk about recreation management and includes the potential for motor vehicle closures that may apply to snowmobiles, ATVs, trucks, and other motor vehicles. So I was just wondering if you have any comments to make about that and whether other motorized recreation groups will be represented in the stakeholder consultation. Thank you. So I think that refers to the program plan. Yeah. So there, there likely will be instances where we want to have a uh, direct engagement with user groups like that, but it'll, it'll happen through the herd planning process. So if an issue comes up that a particular area is causing concern to caribou recovery and we need to talk to mountain bike groups, snowmobilers, four-wheel drive group, then that's where it'll occur. So just to follow up with that, you're talking about integrating these other groups into the conversation. A closer, so you're talking about integrating these other groups into these conversations. How come it's taken until now to have those conversations with the other people? Like, I understand First Nations have, we're on their treaty land, everything like that. But we need to include all the people in this conversation. How come it's taken until now to recognize that our community of Chetwind has a say in this as well? Uh, thank you, that's a good question. Um, as you've heard uh, through some of the presentation today, we wanted to have a stable draft agreement to bring to the discussion. Um, if we didn't have a stable draft agreement, it wouldn't be very easy to have this type of conversation. We also thought, and all the parties to this agreed, that before we bring this in for final decision, we wanted to do this engagement process. And critical to that is beginning here in Chapman. Uh, beginning here in, in the southeast region to start and gather this feedback and hear the thoughts from, from folks in the community. So we're here with a draft to gather these thoughts and gather these ideas from folks in the community. So why weren't we involved in the draft? So what, the question why weren't we involved in the draft is because we were negotiating and it wasn't a stable draft that would have been useful. And that's between BC and Canada uh, to develop that draft. That, that's what we're doing right now, is that engagement process with the community now, before it is finalized. David. Just, just maybe before you go, just to add a bit to that. There is also a, a provincial, it's called the Provincial Stakeholder Call, and it happens roughly monthly. And through those calls, there, there was regular updates on well, what was going on with the section 11, what was going on with the partnership agreement, trying to get the information out there. I know it wasn't what you were looking for in, in the sense of something like this, but there was those ongoing calls that were, were providing some of that information. Yes, go ahead, sir. 
Hi, thank you for coming. I uh, just got a question along the foraging management side. If in these agreements that, I guess, pest management, so in some of these areas there is spruce bark beetle outbreak, uh, if those management strategies are, we're going to ignore that kind of a situation, let those infestations go through, or if there is a plan in place that potentially this large amount of area could have a large amount of dead wood that's no longer used to milling, and due to fiber constraints and then so forth, fires in the future. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so there's still a, an ongoing conversation on on the spruce beetle issue in some of these areas. I, I would say it's it's not completely resolved yet. The I'm, I'm not a biologist, but from what I understand, when you're looking at the value for caribou, um, it still has higher value value for caribou if it's a, a stand impacted by spruce bark beetle or whatnot versus a, a harvested stand that would uh, remove those trees. I do understand that that doesn't necessarily address the beetle issue that, and may, may cause spread in other areas. So like I said, it's, it's, a, it's a conversation that's still occurring. Hi, I was just wondering uh, more along the lines of the work end of it. A little more along the lines of the work end of it, where all these jobs are going to be lost and the values of our property and everything is going to drop uh, quite substantially. I was wondering, like, you got your whole life savings, worked 40 years for what I got and everything else, and one day it's worth 350000 and the next day it's worth 100000 Is there any refund from the government, or is the government going to step up and help the guys that they actually cost them to lose so much money in their property value and stuff like that? So thank you, that's a great question. And that's part of why we're doing that economic, that independent economic analysis, is to understand what these impacts are gonna be. And that'll be used to inform uh, the supports that need to be brought to the community um, with these partners, with the partnership agreement and the section 11 agreement. So that'll be part of why we're doing that, that uh, economic impact analysis to inform what Canada and BC have to do here uh, to help out communities going forward. But will we be able to get any like compensation for what this is going to cost? Well, I, we haven't done the economic analysis. We haven't agreed even to what the terms of how that'll be done. But you know that will inform then what we think those impacts are going to be, which will then inform what supports need to be brought forward to the community. worthwhile us being here. When I hear somebody say, well, I wonder what Vancouver would say? That's insulting. I applaud the view that came up here first and said that was insulting. We're here, we're being respectful and polite to you guys. Why can't we be given the same back? And I demand an apology. That was rude. Yeah. I'll, I'll address that. Um, I'm, I'm sorry you took offense, but it was, it, was, it was a stated fact. If the province tries to implement wolf control over all of these areas, there will be a lot of pushback. There will be international pushback. There is potentially boycotts and issues with the forest industry. It's not an easy situation. That's, that was my only point. It was a, sta a statement of reality. I fully understand that. You could have been worded a different way. However, they don't live here. We do. Sorry, I didn't hear you. To put it in one simple statement is they don't live here, we do. They got no problem coming up here and hunting our moose. Believe me, when it's hunting season, those buckers are all through here like way on rice. So it's okay for them to do that. Okay, if people took offense to that, I apologize, but again, I was simply stating a fact that these are complex issues. There's a lot of people who are going to be involved politically in these, and 
it, it, it seems pretty clear. I mean, a lot of people here would think that the resolution of this should be actually pretty easy. We'll continue with industrial activity, and we're prepared to use wolf control as an ongoing technique to keep caribou around, okay? So that, that's fine. That's, that's what we're here for. We want to hear what the people think. All of my point was, is I can assure you that if the province goes forward with that alone, there's certainly going to be a lot of uh, people in other parts of the province who probably aren't going to think that that's acceptable. So this is not, not really like that simple. I understand that, but again, they, we live here, they don't. So hopefully your guys' backbones are as strong as ours for the here. We hope that you guys do the right thing because letting Vancouver make our decisions is not right for us. Councillor, we got wind of this, what, a year, year and a half ago, and all of this was done behind closed doors, so don't, don't BS us and say there was open consultation. It wasn't. We, we were not involved. We tried to get involved. We sent delegations to Victoria to ask the questions and see what the heck was going on. Nothing. Crickets. Um, it's just... It, it's, it's unbelievable that you guys can pull this off behind closed doors in, in double top secret meetings. It's just un, unbelievable. community of Chetland come out today because I think it's important that without getting a big rush to storm the castle gates uh, that we all have the passion that we need to have because I hear terminology like uh, draft agreements I start getting nervous because I do agree with some of the previous speakers that uh, I just didn't feel like there was a lot of consultation I feel like something's really coming down the pipe I can hear it in the night it's coming it's standing on some tracks and I think I might be in the way. So uh, I, I live right here in the middle of it all too, and I feel that uh, it's important that everybody here tonight needs to be empathetic, understanding why everybody is here, the concerns we get. We're all intelligent people, so let's don't insult everybody's intelligence. At the end of the day, we've got the federal government saying to the provincial government, hey, you guys, get your crap together, deal with this caribou issue, or we're jumping in, we'll show you how to do it. No one wants to talk about the 401 that runs from Windsor all the way to Quebec. It's the biggest, widest, most busiest highway in the North America that's uh, stopping uh, some red horn tree frog from, from not being expurgated itself or whatever. So uh, I just wanted, I wasn't sure where to jump in here tonight and uh, just let everybody know. I think that everybody needs to feel that this is a very, very important item of contention. We've got some beautiful terrain. We live right here in the heart of all of it. And if we just lay back and be told what to do, we're going to end up regretting it. Because I just kind of have this sensation, this spidey sense coming up my back saying, you know what, in the short amount of time, we're going to be told what's going to happen <laughs> instead of getting the real consultation that's happening. Here. And I'm going to tell all of you, some of you might recognize who I am. I don't have an orange hat on tonight, but I'm going to tell you, and I'm no expert. I'm just busy out there struggling, trying to raise my own five family members in the heart of your backyard to make this a better place and community and neighborhood and, and region to live in so that we can all love living here. Pine Pass being right in the heart of it all for all of you that have been out there. I just see some really big problems with this process. It's not that I, we don't love the caribou, of course we do. But at $200,000 for a calf, I mean, come on you guys, we can't even afford a $100 mic here that we have to hold a special little way. is talk about the elephant in the room. There's a process going on and we can just bitch and complain all we want and talk about this and talk about that, but go about the bigger picture. We've got Justin Trudeau out in Ottawa, who where 95% of the Coast Guard lives. They're not even near the coast. All the federal government people, they're out there telling us, if you guys don't deal with your care, but we're coming in with guns blazing, we're gonna shut you down. And it's real easy to jump on the bandwagon and you guys need to have some passion and care for your backyard because I just, my spidey sense says watch out, we're going to be in trouble if we just let this. Because you got to remember that we are out there working every day. So we come home, we read the paper, we get invited to this meeting. We've got people that are in the process that are paid full time. This is their careers to take orders from above 
to implement what has been given down as policy. So I feel like I'm all of us against the few that are educated in the circle. I do agree there's been some closed doors going on here. We've got what, an X amount, the days are ticking by. So I'm just here to remind everybody, this is a very, very important thing. If we let this go by us, we might go, what happened? What happened? Right? So that's all. So I wish everybody the very best. And, and thank you very much for the time today. I guess my questions are going to be, uh, seeing as how you guys are supposed to take the message back to your bosses. Um, we've got a rough idea of what's in two different, very, very loosely worded drafts. Is there any possible way to actually add some detail to these so we actually know what we're looking at? Um, I think that's what I'm hearing is, is what the heck does this thing say? We need to know details. There's too many to be determined in these drafts. Um, David will find out tomorrow that it's going to be real tough to settle on social economic terms of reference when your draft is so loose and you don't even know what the governance structure of all this is going to be. So in order to come up with proper consequences to whatever we're doing here, um, we need more detail. So I think the message back to the government is, you know, it took you about a year to develop this thing. Actually, in Section 11, it took about three years. Uh, the PA agreement, which was thrown at the last minute, took six months. I think we're, we've got to be at least, I mean, we're owed at least that much time in order to digest this, make some suggestions, and turn it into something that's workable for our area. So maybe I'll just say thank you very much. That's a, that's a valuable question, and I'm noting that we need more detail in this, and, and you know, we'll be meeting with, uh, with folks in community and local government over the next uh, few weeks. And we look forward to hearing some more questions like that and bringing those details forward. So that's part of our process uh, that we'll be trying to bring forward those details and looking forward to these questions. Good evening. I hope the people are aware that you have mines, haul drivers, ranchers, farmers, retired people in this community. We also have people who are out in that bush on trap lines making, trying to make a living. And from what I'm hearing, you want to shut this all down. Well, I'm so, sorry to say, I'm ashamed. I spent 25 years in the service. And in two theaters of war, see this country go to hell like this. Why don't you just leave nature alone? We used to hunt, I've been hunting for over 70 some years. But we used to go up in two or three days and get our moose. There isn't a bloody moose back there. And we had to shoot two wolves because we got surrounded by seven wolves one day to get out of it. We went back to get them and they packed them back and tore them apart. You say wolf, wolf decrease in population will bring the caribou up or the moose. How many thousands of years of wolves, moose, coyotes, caribou, elk and deer have lived together and made it this on their own. Every time people get their fingers in this, it goes to hell in a handbasket. Leave them alone. And don't be going down every day and putting everybody out of work. And that's exactly what this is where this is headed. That's all I've been hearing and reading through, between the lines. You're up there sitting there playing politics, trying to make a name for yourself. Well, mister, names don't mean squat. Actions do. 
They'll leave the animals alone and they'll look after themselves. Just put a ban on no hunting on caribou. That's all you have to do. Manitoba had a similar situation with deer. They banned hunting doe. You could only shoot bucks. In a very short few years, they had 28 deer to a quarter section. They looked after themselves. But we shot off coyotes. We shot off wolves whenever we seen them. Guys are out trapping them. They put bounties on them. And in this province, they say you can only shoot three wolves. Well, I'm sorry, we got livestock, and I see 10 of my, my livestock, they're dead. I will hit them if I can hit a bloody deer at a hundred yards smacked in the head. I can kill a wolf or a coyote. Now just leave it alone. Just look after them and let them be on their own and they'll look after themselves. If the wolves and I kill them off, but you gotta think of wolves. Coyotes are just as bad. Bear are gonna kill them off. 50% of calves that are born in the wild, most of them, 50% of them don't even survive because the bears get them or the wolves. So I think you better start looking into the situation of what, what nature does. Ask the people that hunt, ask the people that trap, the people that live out there. Don't go by the scientific crap. <laughs> These guys know what's out there. We know what's happening out there. We see it up and down like a, a toilet leak. It's like rabbits. You have a million rabbits and all of a sudden you've got 20. Five years later you've got a million again. They go in cycles. And for a man being a biologist, you should know that. <laughs> Thank you. So I guess back to the comparison of us in Vancouver. A little closer. Better? Okay, so basically around here, forestry, oil, and mining is what we have. That's what puts our kids in sports, school, allows us to sled, play in the backcountry, hunt, do whatever we do. Now, these closures that we're looking at in these drafts that no one seems to be able to answer a straight question about, we just talk around it, dodge it, walk away. Now, if you were to walk into somewhere in Vancouver and have a closed door meeting like this with their population and tell them you're gonna eliminate 40% of their jobs, how do you think that backlash would be on you guys? Okay, my concern here tonight is, and I've been following this for the last few months here throughout the winter, and over and over again, I don't know how many times, but over and over, there's been meetings announced, and within a day or two of the meeting date, you make your plans, you want to go, it's cancelled. There hasn't been any kind of consultation with people in this area, other than select groups. I, I really would like to know what the reasoning was in that, why we were left out, why the meetings were cancelled. Uh, dozens and dozens of people that I've talked with, same concerns, same questions. What was going on? And I'm with the fellow that just spoke here a few minutes ago. I'm, I'm, I'm dubious, I'm, I'm scared, I, I can see something already signed and sealed in the back room, rolled out, sorry, it's done. I live here, lived here for the last 30 plus years, and I recreate in the back country, it means an awful lot to me, and if I can't still access that, it won't, it won't 
affect my job directly, but it will affect a lot, as has been noted here tonight. It's, uh, I think there's better ways of doing it. If we close off the backcountry to all our recreation, be it berry picking, quadding, snowmobiling, whatever. Um, what's the use of living here? That's our recreation, that's what we, why we live here. It is for me anyway. I could go on all night, but I will pass on to the next. Yes, my name is Dan Ball from House of Flats in Pine Valley. Uh, I'd just like to give you a summary of what the government has done to our community. A few years ago, the government had a Ministry of Highways had a camp on my place. The camp blew up, burned down, and caused an oil spill. And to date, there's been no investigation or oil spill hasn't been cleaned up. Uh, a few months later, the government moved to the submarine pit and had a blasting incident and knocked down several rocks and decided to pick up trucks onto the Vancouver uh, <clears throat> main gas line and the result was uh, a bunch of gravel hauled onto the agricultural land reserve with no... Uh, it's still not settled, eh? Uh, a couple years later, the BC government diverted Commotion Creek into Strand Lake and put a whole bunch of uh, 200 railway ties and a bunch of pavement into a fish bearing lake and a trumpeter swan nesting site. And to date, there's been no investigation and no cleanup. So there's been three, in three years, the BC government has practically wiped out our little community. So I would say the, BC, the Ministry of Environment and the BC government is not competent to, to protect the land or the environment or the curb. Uh, so the, uh, the road to Hull Cross Mountain to the Telus Communication Towers runs through my land, uh, Block A of District Lot 1132. And it goes up into the caribou habitat, so effective immediately the access to that road is close to the BC Bridge. Yeah. So it's just amazing to me how we've gotten this far to this draft without a socioeconomic impact. Like everybody in this room has something to lose here. And how has this not been done yet? You put a price tag at $200,000 a calf and that's too expensive. If everybody here loses $100,000 of value in their homes, is that acceptable? You uh, spoke to the socioeconomic impact assessment and, and you said that that is to determine what, source or what uh, type of resources has to come to town or what uh, type of support. You make it sound like this deal is already signed. Yeah, like, is there a point where it's too expensive? Is there a point where they say, no, we got to go back to the drawing board and figure out something better? Or is this already done? So, thank you. That's a good question. So, to the last part of your question, uh, no, absolutely not. And all the parties to this, uh, to the draft agreements, noted that we wanted to engage with communities before bringing this to decision makers to be finalized. So that's why we're doing this, is to gather these thoughts, to gather this feedback here. Um, as to your first question was sort of, I think, why we haven't done a socioeconomic analysis yet. It was just a statement saying, I just can't believe you didn't. Uh, I'm not asking for a reason. So um, but <laughs> if it helps, I can, I can give you some details on that if it helps. Chances are I'm not going to be satisfied with the answer, so that's fair. Okay. Um, but is there a point at where it's going to be too expensive? Uh, how do you mean? It was what too expensive? Well, I mean, we, we can see the reduction in, say it's going to cost 50% or 75% of the jobs in Shetland, and people are going to lose hundred and fifty or $200,000 for the home value. Like, is there a point where they say, no, this is too expensive, we've got to rework out something that's going to still work, but be less expensive? Well, that's part of why we're here, is to gather this feedback and gather this thought and bring that forward to Cabinet to make that decision. 
Well, I would hope so, but whenever you talk, you just talk with the resources that have to come to help us mitigate with what this is gonna cost. So again, it's not a final agreement. We wanna do that analysis, understand what that impact is, and that'll be the information that we are bringing to cabinet to make that decision. Okay. I just simply want to know how this recovery project is being funded. Pardon, sorry? How it's being funded? How what's being funded? The recovery project. So, uh, if you mean the provincial, the caribou recovery program? Yes. Yes, so that is uh, the, the provincial funding that's being contributed to the provincial caribou recovery program, and that's things like um, uh, maternal penning, habitat restoration, rehabilitation, uh, engagement sessions like this. No, but I mean like where is the money coming from? From the Ministry of Forests. So it's from and the And so how does ministry. the how does the ministry generate their income? Oh, okay. So that's from tax revenue stuff. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. So what you're saying is that when there is going to be a, an economic impact here when you start talking about taking away our jobs you're talking about taking away your own funding essentially or you're saying that our tax dollars simply just don't matter that that is a part of the economic analysis and we've noted that in the the draft scope that we want feedback from communities so is your wage going to stay the same yeah. I, I don't know the answer to that question. really but we do know uh, no but honestly can you can you honestly stand here and look me straight in the face and say that it's it, it's going to impact us but it's not going to impact you is it so we've we've shared the draft with local governments and we want to that's not my question i'm just simply asking you is it, it like is it going to impact you like <laughs> I don't, I don't know, I don't think I'm going to answer that question here today. Of we course, you're not. That's okay. On the program. <laughs> Folks, just before we take the next question, it looks like we've still got a good lineup of uh, folks wanting to express their input. Do you want to take a short break? No. No? Okay. Let's keep going then. I've heard a few times here tonight that you guys are here to take our opinions or our decisions or put our little two cents into the pot that you're going to take back. Now, my idea is we've got a whack of people that live here that work in the forest industry, the oil and gas, and the mining industry. And I can guarantee you that if I ask Everybody that hunts in this room, I bet you half to three quarters of the people put their hands up. Now, on that question, the problem with those guys dying is because of the wolves, correct? Now, we're supposed to do this together as a community to solve the problem. The problem is wolves, us logging, us mining, us doing all the other stuff. We gotta work together, right? So, why don't we who hunt moose, elk, deer, bear, grizzly bear, go out and hunt wolves too? And get paid a decent enough dollar to make it justifiable. 12 months of the year, that would definitely bring it down other than just flying around in a $500 to $800 an hour helicopter. That works too. But get everybody involved, that brings the wolf kill down a lot quicker when everybody gets involved. But when somebody said about trapping, the answer was not good enough. We'd rather spend the $800 an hour to fly around in a helicopter and do it all ourselves instead of having everybody do it together. That's the opinion that I am getting feedback 
that you guys want to do it all yourselves and you want us to help, but not really. That's the way I see things. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. And, uh a part of the of that equation as can trapping but the, the science shows that in a court in order to get the numbers of wolves on the landscape down low enough to have an impact on caribou recovery you have to remove almost all of them and the only way to do that is you have to have some aerial removal maybe not completely but you have to have some a hunting could be a part of the equation, so could trapping. But, but, but we haven't had that science until really only about a year ago where we'd had a five-year trial to, to really understand the issue, and now it's like super clear. We do these things, we can have an impact to caribou recovery. Okay, I'm back again. <clears throat> I'm not comfortable with uh, public speaking, but uh, I have to say a thing or two. I just heard someone mention grizzly bears, and that really rubs a raw spot with me. Grizzly bear hunting was shut down in BC, as everyone in this room knows, because of emotion, not scientific fact. So I'm a little suspicious when I hear you talking about scientific studies that say that you should do this, you should do that. And I would add too that probably the biggest factor in, in that closure was the urban people of Vancouver, the other big centers. I hunted grizzlies for 45 years roughly. It was pretty dear to me. And it really, really, really bothers me. Hi there. I don't really have a question, I just have a comment. Um, I think stepping back a little bit, there is a lot of distrust here, I think, because of the comment the last gentleman made about uh, the grizzly bear hunt, you know, being shut down because of uh, public opinion rather than science. Um, and I think the, uh, it seems to me the, uh, the sense I get here is that people feel that there's a lot of public opinion playing out here in this in this draft rather than uh, science. Science is part of it, but not all of it. Um, the other, I'm just making an observation. I have no, uh, you know, interest other than um, what I see. But I see, uh, you know, in a family, if some siblings get preferential treatment over others, it creates a lot of disgust and resentment within that family. Um, we see two, uh, two members of the family in this community. It seems to me they're benefiting from this agreement and other members of the family are suffer, going to suffer a loss. Uh, it's got to create some um, distrust. Thank, and, but on, on, on the other hand, thanks for coming up here and explaining all this to us. Thank you for the opportunity to get up here and, and say something. Um, this is a a project that I've been involved in. Um, I have the opportunity to be a part of the Quincesa Maternal Penning Project as a member of the industry. And the Quincesa Maternal Penning Project has been and continues to be an ex a success. And congratulations to those who have made it a success. But I wanted to bring out the fact right now that it's a success and in its starting days, it began as a collaborative effort 
between First Nations, industry, and government. And over the last several years, industry has been quietly excluded from this project. More and more taxpayer dollars have been injected into it. We have the results. The project is working. And we should work together to make it work. We want to collaborate and we want to have a say at the table, a seat at the table, not be excluded. Why, over the last few years, have certain industrial partners been quietly excluded from the project? And why has the government allowed a collaborative, jointly funded effort on this project to morph into an almost exclusively taxpayer funded project led by the members of this partnership agreement? Am I on? Uh, uh, let's see. Would it be a good idea uh, to uh, pay the trappers three thousand dollars a wolf? They'll take care of uh, most of the wolves, and uh, I, I don't know what it costs the government, but it'll be a lot more than three thousand to eradicate the wolves with the helicopter. The other thing is. Uh, Probably some people won't like this, but uh, who uh, logged the old grove and uh, 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 fragmented the old grove, which is caribou habitat? I think I know who did that. And uh, finally, I say that nobody has the right to extinguish a species, particularly like the caribou. Thank you. I don't know if I could follow George. Um, I just want to come back to what I was saying before about the land use planning part. And I have been involved with the First Nations since I came here in 1991, and built relationships, and trying to make people understand that if we do protect the spirit and integrity of the treaty, which is based on the land, we can all benefit. Nothing happen, much good happens if we degrade our watersheds. So my hope in this process, it's come out through this, because we can, planners propose and the community disposes. They are going to decide if this has social license. I was involved in the Yukon with the Peel Watershed Plan, 77,000 square kilometer plan also being driven by federal law to implement that treaty, a modern treaty, at the process of about six years. Everybody was there, the Chamber of Mines, Yukon, right through the environmental community, and all their relations internationally. Scientific studies were done and talked about the land base. What could it support? We actually looked at mining possibilities, and the process we took was create scenarios. Well, if we put a mine on the top of this mountain, and a mine waste disposal site, and every, anything happened with that, either trucking, fluid, or whatever, and, and impacted on the river, what would be the consequence? What would be the cost of it? There was a lot of science, and it was heavy on the conservation. I came in and I said, well, what about the socioeconomic part of it? Like, what, is, what, are, we, what are we talking about in terms of mining uh, tenders and all of that? What's the trade-off? What I hear out of this process when we talk about socioeconomic is, what is the baseline? What's the amount of work? If that is there, then you've got a basis. That was done in the Dawson Creek LRMP. And lots of people in this room were involved in this. George, you were involved in this. A lot of people. And how do we come to a resolution? Like, how do we actually end up with an order in council for the Dawson Creek LRMP? Like, was that just thrust on it? Or we said, no, we actually want to do this. Snowmobile organization, everybody. So I'm suggesting that we look at this framework here, because I don't think it can be enforced. I, I just don't. I believe and understand and respect the treaty obligations. I've worked a lot of years to, to help support that. I think there's a lot of benefits. But I do think the possibility here is to talk about interim measures like we're hearing that are common sense approaches on certain strategies 
in the form of an interim measures or something that can still satisfy that. But the government has made a commitment to get back to the land use planning table. And I'm one of those people that has said, look, you got to come back around this table. And people are saying it with a big, want to applaud the idea of planning. It's not the most fun thing, but professional people and interest groups realize, that, yes, and that's going to take maybe another two years to update the Dawson Creek LRMB. So my question is, can we actually push this and couch this within that process to talk about priority areas where we can do certain things, where industry can say if we do certain things, whether it be the predation strategy and all these other things, or habitat, you know what, we can actually benefit and help Moberly Lake. It's called, now called Mo Muddy Moberly, where I live. The degradation of that water quality is constantly in decline, and we've tracked it and monitored it to show what's happening from, and the government previously did a study to actually show and demonstrate that there are certain areas that have caused problems. So my question is, how can we look at this again, not just talk about caribou, but talk about multiple benefits, talk about trade-off scenarios, and evaluate those things in terms of what the actual strategy can be. I know it's a long-winded here, but I think it's a common-sense approach. I'm committed to staying here, and I believe in, in, in the lifestyle and quality of life that we have. I don't, I'm one of those people that would rather be collaborating with. <laughs> Okay, thanks. So I have a question specific to the partnership agreement and the Section 11. Uh, so the burnt pine herd is an extra extirpated herd, is my understanding. So I'm wondering why there are such aggressive um, measures being suggested for potential closures uh, and some of those other things, when we don't actually know if there's any caribou actually in that habitat or using that habitat. So do you have access to caller data that you can show us that shows that there are actually caribou in an area that has been extirpated? Thank you. Sorry, was the question, do we have um, like telemetry data showing overlap with recreation trails? No, the question is, is that the burnt pine herd is an extirpated herd. Okay. Yet, uh, in your mapping, there's aggressive measures that are being taken to protect that habitat. So do you know, and how do you know that there are caribou in that area or going through that area, and why are you taking such extreme measures in an area where there are no caribou living? Okay, so you're asking specifically about what measures are happening in the burnt pine herd, and... The, the burnt pine herd is extirpated. It doesn't, it's not there. Yep, that's accurate. That was part of Dale's presentation. Right, so yet, in your map, there are extreme measures that you're suggesting for okay. that, that area. Why would you do that when we don't actually know that there are any caribou that have been there in the last decade or more. So you're, you're referring to the partnership agreement zones? I, no, I'm asking why you're making extreme measures or suggesting extreme measures for closures and other things when you can't be certain that there are caribou in that area or you're certainly not proven yeah. to us. I just want to be really clear that I'm understanding you're referring to the, the zones on the partnership agreement now? Correct. Okay. I think I'll ask somebody who's a little closer to the agreement to talk about how the partnership agreement zones overlap the burnt pine herd, which is, as she pointed out accurately, a uh, herd that is considered to be extirpated. So I, I don't have the exact herd maps, and maybe we need to look at a different map a little bit later. They, they are over there. Um, the, the proposed or the interim protection that's being proposed. It is not necessarily only about what exists now. It is about growing those populations. And you're right, burnt pine is extirpated. Um, but the majority of the, the protection is in areas and for herds that are actually starting to do quite a bit better and starting to, to make that uphill swing as a result of, of predator management, the quinzaza pending, and, and other measures as well. So it's to allow some growth. Um, there was a gentleman up here speaking about maternal penning with industrial groups and he had a very specific question that no one came up and asked, uh, would answer to. And I would like someone to come up and answer that gentleman's question. Why has industry slowly been 
excluded over the years when they were involved to begin with. I'll try to answer it. I think I understand the question. Um, why has industry been excluded? First of all, uh, I, I, I don't accept the premise of that, that they are not, no one's excluded. We are beginning here now. We are looking forward to talking with folks in local government, meeting with you, um, and meeting with industry as well. And so in addition to these community meetings that we'll be doing today uh, through the rest of the month of April, we are going to be meeting with local governments, and we will be meeting with representatives from industry over the coming months to, to talk about ideas that they have, to talk about the impacts, and talk about how we can do this together. So actually, that will be done together. Excuse me, but actually they have been excluded. There's only four groups that are in party to the agreement. Federal government, provincial government, West Mobile First Nations, and SOTA. Those are the only parties that are a part of the agreement. You excluded industry completely. You excluded everybody except for two First Nation groups, federal government and provincial government. And, and we have now a stable draft that we're, we're appreciating the feedback and the thoughts on this. Uh, just a couple of comments. Um, the first comment I have is, is that moose and caribou in this region have been surviving for long before the caribou have started to die out in those areas. I don't understand the thought process of trying to eliminate or degrade the amount of moose in those areas uh, at all. It doesn't make any sense. Moose were moose and caribou for years and years and years and years have been able to manage to get along together. Secondly, um, I don't know how you can have an initial agreement in which you worked on for nine months together and they turn around and say that you're going to negotiate with us and the two signatures from the two First Nations don't mean anything because you've actually negotiated for nine months to reach that point. It seems to me that you're basically going to tell us the agreement that you've got and we really have no feedback on this at all. So you're right, there's initials on the agreement from the First Nations, the province, and the federal government. Um, at the end of this engagement, all of those parties will have to look at what we've heard and make a decision on whether their, their governments support the agreement, so, or if they agree that changes should be made. So I think, um, of course, that option still exists. There's actually, a, I made a few lists here, and at my peril, I'll bring up some old things. Um, somebody mentioned earlier about consultation, and, and uh, I, I think I referred to these, these stakeholder meetings. You're right, those were never meant to be consultation meetings, they were information sharing meetings. And I, apologize, I apologize if I mis misrepresented that. Um, someone else earlier said uh, closing these areas to, to um, berry picking and access to the public. That's, that's not in these agreements, it's not something we've talked about. We've talked about recreation, um, snowmobile management. Um, but not actually closing areas and preventing access. That's not on right now. And then finally, um, a fellow brought up uh, landscape planning. Um, landscape, the, the um, LRMP process and, and landscape level planning. Um, this agreement does do some stuff in the interim and, and some pretty significant protection measures. Um, but there is, a, there's, there's another part to it and it, it is about herd planning, and it's about uh, looking at it um, at a, a landscape level approach to do other measures in this area um, that considers all those values, for sure. Uh, thank you uh, for all the response, even if some of it was uh, a little bit uh, muddy. Uh, anyway, my name is Al Kutre. Uh, I've been a sawmill worker for 41 years and an Indian all my life. So for the people that... Uh, uh, 
all of my brothers that are not here today, uh, chiefs uh, that were uh, scheduled on the agenda. I don't see any of my brothers here, so anyway, I'm not going to protect them. I'm not going to protect anybody from uh, uh, believing in their rights to uh, live a decent life in this province. But uh, what I am going to protect is the word of, uh, of respect and uh, what little we got by canceling uh, meetings. So, and uh, from the Vancouver uh, thing, uh, I, I, I think I just read it. Anyway, but my question is that they're written all over this uh, document, even though it is a draft, the indigenous part. Uh, they're uh, right through this whole thing. And uh, when we say we only have four partners in that, and two of them being First Nations and two being uh, outside that, uh, the government being one, Right? And somebody saying that not being uh, industry and stakeholders. Stakeholders meaning, I think, all the taxpayers in, in this area and throughout uh, the province of BC. Uh, my question is, uh, do, I have, uh, do I have a draft uh, that I can change or will my brothers uh, in the in, indigenous brothers have a say saying, no, that will not happen? Uh, does anybody on that side or, or any side say that we have somebody that will uh, propose something and somebody squash it because they say, you know, this line has been drawn, we cannot cross it, and is there something definite or is it all open? So, good question. Um, through this engagement, we're going to get feedback, and it might, um, there might be some requests to change the document for sure. And, and I think your question was, can can, uh, can somebody quash that or, or veto that that I guess suggestion? Is that that accurate? Yes. Okay. Um, so of course, yeah. And so they can choose at that point whether they they um, they they can't support the agreement in a changed form, and then the decision will have to be made by those other governments on whether they can live with it without that change form if, if, if those parties decide they can't live with it. So then at that time, BC may say, well, given this, this uh, request and our feelings on this, we need it to change, and if it can't change, we're not prepared to enter the agreement as it is. So yes, I, I think the answer is correct. Yes, somebody could do that, and then it would rely on the other parties to make the decision on whether they still want to enter that agreement. My name's Jennifer. I've lived in this community for 35 years. Um, I'd like to thank everybody who's brought out their points of interest. Um, my question is, is we've got the potential of one of our sawmills going down, and as Mr. Roy pointed out, that's $24 million. We have 5,000 residents that all are, have the potential of losing $100,000 on their homes. So that is a lot of revenue for the town. It's a lot, a lot of revenue for the province. What is the rush on getting this out by May 2019? That's 30 days you're gonna give the impacted communities, because it's not only Chetwin, it's Tumblr Ridge, it's Hudson's Hope, it's Mackenzie, there's a lot of jobs. One town alone, we're looking at quite a lot of revenue. So what is the rush to have this out by May 2019? communities having that information ahead of time that social economic what are we as the communities in northern BC what do we stand to lose we should have that answer before this is even rolled through it could take months to do that. so if they don't have the social economic portion of this are they not going to roll it through in, two, in 30 days I guarantee for the amount of time it's taken to get this much information how much time is it going to get or is it going to take to get the information of what the loss on all the northeastern BC communities that these caribou are going to affect for all the people that live here I think that will be picked up in the socioeconomic study. And will that study be released before? Right? 
So I just wanted to respond to the timing issue. So the consultation period is four or five weeks uh, here. Then governments are going to make decisions that they're going to make. Then some of the decisions could be to give more time. There's a whole range of options that, that um, cabinets will look at. So really what we're focusing on is to get that feedback on what is being proposed here. But one of your slides show your proposals to be put through in May 2019, that's next month. That you've only been given one day. So I think we're hearing a message here that people want more time. I think there will be this... Facebook of all places was Facebook. There's no media telling anybody. There's a lot of mill workers that, that don't even know this means exists and that, what, what's happening. There's a lot of hunters that don't know. And all the way down to Williams Lake, uh, 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 Kamloops, all over places that hunt up in this territory here too, and that would support paying uh, or contributing towards the call of wolves because we have too many of them. Why is it that you guys aren't reaching out to the public so that everybody has a, has a say on this? And that, that the only reason I found out about it was to the Snowbill Club. Like you're not, you're not promoting this to anybody. It's like a, a secret, it's, it's hush, and the only reason a lot of these people are in here is because they belong to 4x4 clubs, Snowbill clubs, uh, hunting clubs and whatnot. The general public that would support us have no clue this is going on. Uh, there is some information online, but um, if there are other ways that we can we can tell more people about this, uh, please let us know. Uh, let local governments know. Let us know directly. If there's other venues we should be sharing the information, let us know. Uh, we'd like to take advantage of all those opportunities. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for having the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I don't see them in the room, but a couple of things that I wanted to say was I know that uh, our member of parliament, uh, Bob Zimmer, has been fairly active um, in the last few months trying to raise awareness around the situation. And I think it's important to say a thank you to the work that him and uh, Mike Bernier have been doing as well. Um, a little bit of history for myself. I know a lot of people in this room. Uh, there's a lot of strangers that I don't know, but. In the 25 years that I've been here, one of the common reasons that I've shared with people is, is I mean, the main reason why I ended up in Chetland is from a similar process to this that happened on Vancouver Island 25 years ago. I had a career, I had a job, I had a home, but I couldn't stay there because government made decisions to protect fish, owls, create new parks, protected areas, and because of that, I was displaced, so I moved here. And I share that same common story, you know, and I, and I still keep running into people day after day that are the same thing. They're from all over Canada, they're from all over BC, and they keep coming to Chetland because there was jobs, there was a home, there was an opportunity to create a future and have a family. And because of government decisions in all of those areas, they lost their jobs and they lost those opportunities and they've ended up here. And now here we are in Chetland, looking at this again. And you know, for me, it's only 25 years later, and I'm kind of wondering, you know, what's what's next? Where do I go from here? It's starting to get, you know, scary because when you look around the country, there's less and less places. You know, before you always used to be able to go and think, well, geez, I lost my job here. Where do I go next? Well, geez, there's a mine opening up in northern Alberta. Maybe I'll go there for work. But the common story that we keep hearing all over the place is that those opportunities aren't there anymore. And I think, you know, part of what's scary with, with what I've heard tonight, and, and I just want to end off with this, is that, you know, you, I think it's, it's been made pretty clear that your process up to date has been very flawed. And I would hope that what you would take away from this is that, and I know there's another gentleman who's been up here a couple of times, and he talked about all the different land use planning and some of the other previous um, 
processes that we've gone through in this area, and they've worked really well. And why did they? Because they engaged everybody right from the start and developed a plan with everybody's input. It's pretty clear that that has not been done in this case, and I would hope that you would realize your mistakes. And before you leave here tonight, the message that you should be taking away is, is that maybe the best thing that you guys could do, I'm not saying stop and don't do nothing, but maybe agree that the process that you've used is flawed and wrong. And before you keep heading down the path and trying to force this down somebody's throat, that maybe you stop and think maybe you should start over again. Thank you. I have uh, two, two questions or comments. One is for the Premier himself at this point, or the Minister of Forests. What's the number? How many jobs are you willing to lose? That's what we really want to know. At what point will you stop and turn around? Is it 500? Is it 1,000? Is it 2,000 jobs? What's the number? That's what we're all here trying to find out. Do we actually get to pay for our houses? At what point will you think that we're important enough? And before that consultation of the economics is done, we want that number public so that when that independent consultation comes back, we actually know if you kept your word or not. We want clarity, we want openness, and at the very least, we want someone like the Peace River Regional District included as one of those four groups not just someone that's informed afterwards what happened. We want them in the talks with the same weight as the four groups that are already there. I think we are owed that. These have been such good questions and comments that we've been hearing. Last March, on March 28th, in fact, just a few days over a year ago, I asked one of those questions to the minister himself in his office. How much are you willing to sacrifice on our behalf? And his answer was silence. He had no answer. In late October, I was with uh, a delegation of three others, I think, from Regional District and Chetland Council, to the um, Ministry of Environment. We were expressing our concern about the potential mill closures, and almost reflexively, he responded, absolutely not. That was in the morning. In the afternoon of the same day, in the meeting with um, the uh, Deputy Minister of Forests, we went away from that meeting feeling a whole lot less um, comfortable. His comment on on jobs, what's, what's uh, a couple hundred jobs? As if a job is just something you post up on a, on a bulletin board and it's, uh, but jobs are people, jobs are home, jobs, and, and you know, if you have owner operators of trucks, of processors, of skitter bunchers, and they lose here, they're not going to be able to just pack up and go to Quinnell or go to Blue River or anywhere else. It, it, those jobs are not going to be easily found. Ultimately, this is a political decision. It's not going to be based on caribou. Caribou may be the uh, the um, talking point on this, but really it's a political decision made in Ottawa, made in Victoria, and um, people, we have to face the facts. Our influence in either place is not very big. So the more noise we can make, the more rational answers uh, we can give, the stronger we're going to be. But boy, we're going to have to do it.
anymore. But pretty passionate, pretty informative about your views. Absolutely. Is there anybody else who want to provide some input? Do you guys know why the lion is in Yellowstone to Utah? Yeah. Do you? Do you know who they are and what they're about and where they originated from? A little bit, yeah. Okay, well I've been digging up some dirt on them and they're an American organization that's moved to Canmore that has fundings coming from not only overseas but a pile of coming from the U.S. And when I see one of their funders that was U.S. oil and gas industries looking into the white y piggy bank to come up here and shut our industry down, what kind of people are they? And then I see the video of them in Edmonton at a conference and she cracked up and quote Wilson and said, that was our godson. He was our only light to stand on. And really, I couldn't figure out why the UN was involved in why to why. I couldn't put this together. And then that video explained it. The little dinner bell went off my head. It's a fresh water. The smoke screen is the caribou and the natives and the us. This has already been done and decided. You guys got to step up to the plate and go tell everyone else what's going on in this world and quit being some goddamn secrets. Hey! Yes, I've worked with governments now right through from well, WAC Bennett, right through I've had 22 years as Mary Chapman helping to build this up. And Merlin, I agree with what you say. You know, the trouble is we go ahead and we work and we build it up. And all and right now you've been working on this for three years. You come up here and say you've got 30 to 60 days. You have, then nothing will change. All you're doing is, is coming up here and giving us lip service. And it's a good time you come up because this is April the 1st, and I think this is a good April 1st Fool's joke. But it, it bothers me, you know, it's uh, Wes Fraser. I helped West Fraser come and get established here. It was a tremendous benefit for the community. We, we need two mills here to make the town go. The, and now you say about wolf problems. Within two miles of here, my ranch starts. I lose, uh, I would say, up to about 5% of my calves every year to wolves. Wolves and coyotes. And uh, if you want to go ahead and shoot the, kill the, uh, the moose off, all you're going to do is just drive more wolves down. There was one of the ranchers out Jackfish Roadway who lost 29 calves last year to wolves. What, you know, you, 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 you don't understand. You people come from Victoria, you come up with ideas, you read books, but you don't know Sikkim as far as go, what goes on in this country. Um, as far as the Lower Mainland, I spent 12 years on council in the Lower Mainland. I was president of the Lower Mainland Municipal Association. And those people down there haven't got a clue on what goes on up here. They, um, half the people in the Lower Mainland think that BC ends at Holt and the other half are sure it ends at Kamloops. But it's, uh, um, they have a lot to say in decisions that are made here, but we have nothing to say on decisions that are made down there. They can spend billions of dollars on rapid transit, we can't even get a proper bus service here. We are... We are the revenue place that generates the money that produces the rest of the, for the lower mainland and the rest of BC. We have the gas, the oil, the power, everything. If one of these days that we just turn the lights out and uh, turn the tap off, we should let the lower mainland freeze in the dark. I thank you.
just have a comment to make about the partnership agreement. Um, I understand why the First Nations are involved in it. They've definitely got a lot of traditional knowledge that would be very useful. Uh, but you've got two people representing less than 2,000 people out there. The rest of the regional district is about 60,000. I think that we need at least one seat on that partnership agreement. The other thing of it is, is a socio-economic study. We need to know what we're going to lose uh, in a, as a community, as a regional district. Uh, before this goes forward, we need to know. And it's not as if we haven't been trying. We've been begging for maps. We've been begging to be at the table. We've been begging for information. We could have set up different scenarios, some loose numbers anyhow, but we need to know. And the timeline you've given us right now is not adequate. And we've been trying for months for information, so it's not a lack of effort on our part. We need to know. So here we are towards the end of the evening. It's going to wind up. Everybody's going to walk out and go, what did we accomplish here tonight? I think we need to kind of sum summarize it up a little bit. Uh, just a quick couple of comments. Mount Washington tried to introduce the marmot back onto the uh, mountain. Eagles ate it the next year. They did it again, the wolves ate it the next year. They hired enough biologists to go up there and just keep putting the marmots up there and put a gun to their head and said, you guys mate, you guys are gonna proliferate. You're gonna give her. But at the end of the day, you know, we got big picture issues. We got global warming, we got industrialization, everybody's played monopoly, what happens? It all gets a one by one big guy at the end. So we got big picture stuff. But at the end of the day, we gotta finish up tonight's meeting. Everybody's taking time away from their family to be here to be part of something that could have an everlasting effect on your lifestyle. And not everybody's commented tonight and made very valid points. I want to get away from the bitch and the whine and the crying and the complaining and get down to brass tacks. These nice people have come out here tonight to represent the government as a voice, or sorry, as a uh, ear to our voices. But what we really need to know is at the end of the night when we leave, and they go on to the next meeting tomorrow night, the next one after the next, because they got to get this 30-day thing done. <clears throat> we need to make sure that the plan is in place, that Victoria hears, and Justin Trudeau hears, because uh, everybody's forgetting about this. A lot of complaining that the province, that the province. It's the David Suzuki's and the Sierra Clubs that are driving Justin Trudeau to get out there and let's save the caribou. I get it, we all love the caribou, but they're putting pressure on the province to get this thing done, or the, pro the governments the, from the federal government is going to come in here and deal with all this stuff, the Endangered Species Act. So what we need to make sure is before we leave tonight, there's representation, because these are, are the, these are the messengers, there's no point in beating them up. They need to be able to go back and say, hey look, we went to Chetwin and the people weren't very happy. In fact, if we made more announcements that more people, that there was this big meeting going on, there probably would have been two hallfuls full of people to come out. But we need to make sure that it's clear that we have a system in place to represent your opinions here tonight. But how you feel, what your thoughts are, to get back to Victoria, who's negotiating with Ottawa, to make the decisions that we've all assumed have already been made. But we're hopeful that there's some process in the democracy of our country that we're going to be able to get through all this. Now, I don't know what the answer is. I'm just a spokesperson. I'm just sitting back going, man, if I don't sit up and say something right now tonight, I'm going to sit here and bite my tongue all the way back to the Pine Pass. But man, I should have said more tonight. Because everybody here has a big part and a vested interest in what we got going on here. So I think the uh, politicians in our region, who, the people who represent us, need to make sure that what we've said tonight has gone on in part of the meetings. Because this is the part that's really making us all mad. All these meetings, meetings, meetings. I know, I've been trying to like, oh, can you give me some? No, no, sorry. No. We'll let you know. There'll be, a, there'll be a meeting. Don't worry, we'll let you know. We'll let you know. There's just some maps and all that kind of stuff, right? But at the end of the day, here we got 30, 60 days. We're going to get this... Uh, this draft agreement. How can it be a draft agreement? We haven't even they haven't got our opinion yet. I mean, they're just listening to us tonight. So, again, I'm just a, I'm just a dumb guy who lives in the Pine Pass, but from what I can see, we need to make sure we have that representation, that our voices tonight are being heard, hurt. otherwise we're just wasting our time here tonight, that our opinions that we have are represented when it gets back to Victoria, because they got to negotiate with Ottawa. Ottawa just got the big hammer, you know? Justin Trudeau's great when there's a tsunami and when there's going to be a world war, but also when they're going to shut down the economy of Northern BC because they want to protect the caribou when it may or may not even work. Again, I'm not a biologist, 
the biologists that I have talked to couldn't give me any really good answers as to the implications of losing the caribou. Do we have a dung beetle that eats their dung? What happens when we lose the caribou, right? Well, we just lose the rest of the caribou. I don't know. Start giving my opinion. And I would be more than happy to have anybody else come on up and give me their, give me their opinion here too. So, sorry about uh, taking up too much of your time tonight, but there's a lot of passion here tonight. It needs to be made sure it's represented and put to good use. Victoria and Ottawa, I hear what you guys have to say tonight. So that's what I'm hoping for. We got some representatives that are going to be uh, making sure their opinion is heard. Yeah, well said. And uh, we've got three hours now. Victoria and Ottawa are here listening. Uh, passionate, thoughtful, uh, substantive, lots of really good input. And we recorded all of it. And. Um, there still is another opportunity for those of you that still would like to provide input. We do have a feedback form that's on Engage BC. You can fill it out if you want. We'd love to hear more from you. This is critical. The things we said from the outset is getting that input and making sure that we get these agreements right. So I'm going to ask uh, Tom to say a few words. We've got a few more people wanting to speak. Okay. Thank you. Uh, what I'm asking uh, is uh, once we decide and once we've had some uh, input, are we going to be able to come back to Chapman and say this is uh, part of the agreement? Uh, we've heard you, we've uh, talked to other uh, municipalities, other areas. Are we going to get another uh, chance to uh, have a question period here? That's a, that's a thanks for the question and we've been sort of chit-chatting over here about how do we, I mean the, the feeling is is that we do have to come back. Uh, I think there was a, a lot of really good input, heartfelt input. And it, it probably takes a bit of time to think about what you wanted to say and, uh, and I'd like to be able to commit to coming back. I know that we have an incredibly tight timeline that we're working in and I, and I know how frustrating that is for you and I completely understand it but I don't know how we don't come back here and talk to you again about what we've heard as we've traveled around the piece as we've had further conversations with uh, decision makers in Victoria so I'm not sure when it is uh, but I'd like to say that I'll, I'll be back here um, yeah Me? hi um, I went on Engage BC and I tried to fill out your survey and the questions are all about Annex 2 so there's a whole bunch of activities on Annex 2 that you've done and acti activities that you're planning on doing. Whether or not I answer those questions is valuing what people answer. Like they ask you, what do you agree with? What do you disagree with? What actions do you agree with? Why do you disagree with them? Are those actions going to be changed? by input from people, or there, it's just a list of things that you're planning on doing. Winter of 2020, you're doing this, and spring of 2019, you're doing this. And that's what we that Engage BC asks us for our opinions on your actions. It doesn't ask for our opinions on your agreement. So it's really confusing to go on to that Engage BC and try and answer those questions. And it's all about Annex 2, which is beyond the draft partnership agreement. Thanks for the question. I'm just going to pull up the Engage BC site so that everybody knows what we're talking about here. Um, da -da -da. So there's a link to this website on the agenda that you guys received when you walked in the door tonight. Um, this is where you'll find a lot of information about the two agreements. So the Section 11 agreement and the Partnership Agreement, both draft versions are posted here. You can view them, uh, frequently asked question document, and then an overview of each draft agreement is sort of, you know, these are really long, complicated documents, so we try to compile them into something that's uh, not, not quite as complex to read through. 
Uh, there's also a PowerPoint presentation there. So all those documents are also available at the back of the room tonight if you want to take home a paper copy. And the feedback form is here. That's, uh... And so the questions that, oh, of course it's not working. Um, the questions that the individual was asking about, there's a first set of questions that speak to the Section 11 agreement and they talk about Annex 2. So the Section 11 agreement has a portion of it called Annex 2 that's about 15 pages long and it lists a bunch of different actions that government's considering and it asks you, what do you think of these actions? And then if you click on the next page of the feedback form, it's asked you about the partnership agreement, which is the agreement focused on the central group. Um, and so just to clarify, those are the two different types of questions you'll be asked. The feedback forms are also available here tonight and we're happy to walk through those with people. And the posters on the sidewall speak more to those two agreements. So if you guys have any questions, feel free, once we're done the Q&A, to just come up to staff that'll be standing there and you can ask those more specific questions. And you also asked about how information is going to be used. Um, and so I'm gonna ask Russ to come up and speak a little bit about how all of this feedback is going to be gathered, um, you know, how you'll see it reported out and how it could be reflected in future versions of this work. Sure, thanks. And, and I think we've covered this a couple of times now. Um, so the information is to be gathered, it's to be compiled into a report, reports to be made available, and, uh, and then ultimately, potentially, especially in a Section 11, there's probably some opportunities to make changes in, in agreement with the federal government, depending on what feedbacks we hear. So absolutely, we can look at all that feedback. will will help inform decision makers on either decisions to implement or decisions to make changes to those documents, or the Annex 2, or anything within them. Okay, so. Tom, say a final word, so. I kind of, I guess I kind of have said it, but I'll say it again, is that thank you very much for coming out tonight. Uh, we have hopefully captured all the comments and we will be pouring over those comments and distilling them and taking advice from the group. We know that this is, and we, we were aware coming into this meeting, that there was a lot of frustration in the community, and I think that that is clearly on display tonight, and I completely get that, as does my team. Uh, we are wanting to make sure that we fully understand this, and I, I guess what I'll say is, there is a lot of discussion around the uh, length of time for engagement, and there's a lot of concern around the socioeconomic analysis that will be done. And while it's not going to uh, necessarily be perfectly executed, I can assure you that your, your voice and the socioeconomic analysis that is completed with feedback and input from communities will be part of the decision-making process that government will go through. And no decision will be rendered without decision makers fully understanding what the consequences of the partnership agreement mean for the town of Chatwin. So I can commit that to you today and we will come back, or at least I will, I will come back and we will convene again around what we've learned and what more we can share. And can we dig in a bit deeper into what's in the partnership agreement and explain it maybe in, in better detail for you. But thank you very much. Uh, appreciate your time. I know you've taken time away from your family, from your jobs, from your hobbies, and from your interests. But we do appreciate the passion and the input that you provided here tonight. Thanks, Tom. And uh, you noticed we've got the posters on the side. The government people are planning on staying for as long as you want to stay to talk to them a bit more about the information. Uh, as we mentioned, the feedback forms are there. Uh, summaries of the agreements, help yourself, and uh, once again, thanks very much. The uh, passion has just been amazing. Have a safe trip home.